Muy buenas tardes. Damos inicio a la reunión 2087 del Comité contra la Tortura y me es eh, muy grato dar nuevamente la bienvenida a la delegación de la República de Azerbaiyán para continuar eh, nuestro diálogo que iniciamos el día de ayer. Y de inmediato le ofrezco la palabra a su excelencia, al señor Samir Sharibov, eh, jefe de delegación y viceministro de Relaciones, de Relaciones Exteriores. Tiene usted la palabra. Adelante. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, distinguished uh, members of the committee, Uh, yesterday, we had a fruitful dialogue um, uh, during which a number of uh, issues was raised by the committee um, uh, members. And due to the time restraints, my delegation was able to address part of the questions raised and today is ready to provide committee members with the further updated and detailed information. Let me now, um, uh, without taking much more time, to give uh, the floor to the members of our delegation. And now, uh, first, I, I want to ask uh, to take the floor Mr. Uh, Fazil Kuliyev, uh, Deputy Minister uh, of Internal Affairs, to address uh, the issues uh, raised uh, by uh, yesterday by Todd, uh, Mr. Todd uh, Backwald and Louis Huavan on the <clears throat> issues of uh, access to justice and lawyers, application Uh, of the rights of detained persons, the right to be informed uh, about the detention and arrest, uh, the rights of defenders and journalists, human trafficking, increasing the professional training of personnel and issues uh, related to the juvenile justice. Please, Mr. Goliev, you have the floor. Спасибо. Уважаемый господин представитель, Уважаемые члены комитета, работа по полной и эффективной реализации рекомендаций Комитета ООН против пыток в повседневной практической деятельности проводится на основе специального плана и находится на постоянном контроле. Согласно национальному законодательству, руководство мест содержания полиции обязано немедленно после задержания обеспечить подозреваемому возможность устно или письменно сообщить о своем задержании родственникам и близким. Учитывая, что многие граждан, задержанные граждане могут не знать о своих правах и обязанностях, в полиции на видных местах установлены специальные телефонные аппараты для связи с родственниками и иными лицами, а также с номерами горячей линии Института омбудсмена и Азербайджанского комитета против пыток. Там же размещены стенды с текстом закона об, об обеспечении прав и свободы лиц, содержащихся в местах лишения свободы на азербайджанском, русском и английском языках. Для того, чтобы лица, доставленные в полицию или задержанные, могли более тщательно изучить свои права, им выдаются отдельные буклеты с указанием их прав. При необходимости Содержание буклета разъясняется в устной форме. В соответствии с правилами для подробного документирования содержания в полиции, на каждого задержанного составляется электронный информационный листок единого образца, где отражаются все сведения о пребывании задержанного в местах временного содержания, в частности, о проведении медицинского осмотра, распорядке дня, информирование родственников, встречах с адвокатом, законными представителями и так далее. Все места временного содержания полиции оборудованы системами видеонаблюдения. Перемещение задержанных и их общений с работниками находится под постоянным контролем ответственных сотрудников. Для реализации прав задержанных на встречу со своими адвокатами и законными представителями в конфиденциальной обстановке решением Министерства внутренних дел в октябре прошлого года в местах временного содержания органов полиции выделены специальные комнаты, 
и созданы все необходимые условия для проведения таких встреч. При этом нет никаких ограничений, как по времени, так и по количеству встреч, задержанных с адвокатами и родственниками. Правила эти неукосительно соблюдаются, и их нарушение влечет за собой незамедлительное привлечение к ответственности. Особое внимание уделяется вопросам оказания медицинской помощи задержанным и арестованным, которые подлежат немедленному медицинскому осмотру с момента поступления в орган полиции. На каждого из них оформляется специальная медицинская карта, в которой отражаются все сведения о состоянии здоровья, а также тех или иных телесных повреждениях, если они имеются, и причинах их возникновения. В случае, если арестованный или задержанный заболел, либо получил телесные повреждения во время пребывания в местах временного содержания, проводится медицинский осмотр, результаты которого письменно сообщаются его адвокату. При необходимости задержанный в обязательном порядке обеспечивается медицинской помощью. Им предоставлено право самостоятельного выбора медицинского учреждения или специалиста для проведения обследования. В целях расширения права задержанных и арестованных на самостоятельный выбор медицинского учреждения или специалиста в настоящее время на стадии рассмотрения находятся законопроекты, об отмене порядка, о вынесении по данному вопросу постановления. Учитывая, что в полиции задержанные содержатся на достаточно короткий срок, держать штатных медицинских работников для каждого из почти 85 мест временного содержания не представляется возможным. Поэтому медицинский осмотр задержанных проводится по приглашенными врач, э, врачами территориальных медицинских учреждений. Для контроля за положением дел в местах временного содержания в вопросах соблюдения прав задержанных налажена четкая система реагирования на все заявления и жалобы, особенно связанные с информацией о случаях пыток и других незаконных действий. Проверка по таким фактам осуществляется Управлением внутренних расследований Министерства. В случае подтверждения полученной информации принимаются меры дисциплинарного и иного наказания в соответствии с законом. При наличии жалоб, связанных с пытками и бесчеловечным или унижающим достоинством обращения, а также подозрений в том, что телесные повреждения могут быть нанесены в результате такого обращения, Информация об этом незамедлительно направляется прокурору. В целях изучения условий содержания и соблюдения прав задержанных и наличия возможных жалоб созданы необходимые условия для проведения прямого и неограниченного мониторинга в местах временного содержания со стороны наблюдателей от правительственных и неправительственных организаций. Таким образом, в 2020-2023 годах проведено в общей сложности 358 подобных мониторингов. Определенные шаги предпринимаются и в направлении развития ювенальной юстиции. Справедливое правосудие в отношении несовершеннолетних должно совершаться с обязательным учетом их физиологических и психологических особенностей. Согласно законодательству, Опрос несовершеннолетних проводится с обязательным присутствием их представителей. При необходимости обеспечивается участие специалиста-педагога, врача, а в случае, когда несовершеннолетние являются подозреваемыми или обвиняемыми, то и адвокатом. Несовершеннолетние не могут отказаться от помощи адвоката, и он назначается в обязательном порядке. Избрание меры пресечения в виде ареста для детей допускается только в случае совершения ими менее тяжких насильственных, тяжких или особо тяжких преступлений и только после тщательного разбирательства. Законодательством запрещено содержание ребенка под стражей вместе со взрослыми, за исключением случаев, когда этого требуют его интересы. Хотел бы также отметить, что 
для эффективного решения задач, стоящих перед органами полиции, в том числе и в области защиты конституционных прав и свобод человека, только в 2020-2023 годах в многочисленных семинарах, тренингах, курсах и онлайн-мероприятиях, организованных в нашей стране и за рубежом, по обсуждаемой тематике было задействовано около 52 тысяч участников от Азербайджана. А на занятиях в системе профессиональной подготовки большинство тем посвящено правам и свободам человека. По завершении каждого учебного года в специальной комиссии проводится проверка уровня приобретенных сотрудниками знаний, а каждые пять лет их аттестация. Кроме того, значительно расширена учебная программа Академии полиции. В рамках предмета уголовный процесс и криминалистика предусмотрено проведение лекций, семинаров, практических занятий по изучению тематики проведения допросов задержанных и арестованных. Учебные программы текущего года предусматривают также изучение тем, включенных в подготовленные Европейским Союзом методические рекомендации о проведении допросов и о принципах эффективного проведения опросов. Изучается порядок работы с задержанными и в школе подготовки рядового и младшего начальствующего состава. Ведь в основном именно эта категория сотрудников, как правило, несут службу в местах временного содержания. Проводимая работа по реализации положений Конвенции ООН против пыток была обсуждена и на заседании коллегии в октябре 2020 года и приняты необходимые решения по дальнейшему повышению эффективности работы на данном направлении. Что касается случаев самоубийств в местах временного содержания, то за 2020 в 2023 годы зарегистрировано 7 подобных фактов. По каждому из них проведена служебная проверка и 27 сотрудников полиции привлечены к дисциплинарной ответственности за отсутствие должного контроля за задержанными. В том числе семеро уволены со службы, один освобожден от занимаемой должности, в отношении 19 применены другие меры дисциплинарного воздействия. Особое внимание уделяется такому важному направлению деятельности, как борьба с торговлей людьми. В 2020 году утвержден четвертый национальный план действия по борьбе с торговлей людьми в Азербайджанской республике на 2020-2024 годы. В результате мер, принятых в рамках выполнения данного плана, за последние четыре года выявлено 627 преступлений, связанных с торговлей людьми, и 14 фактов привлечения к принудительному труду, жертвами которых стали 374 человека. За торговлю людьми привлечено к уголовной ответственности 69 человек, из которых 50 – приговорены судами и, различными срок, и различным сроком лишения свободы. Утвержденный постановлением, постановлением Кабинета министров Азербайджанской Республики от 3 сентября 2009 года правила выявления жертв торговли людьми определяют механизмы, позволяющие установить, является ли то или иное лицо жертвой. За этот же период в безопасный приют, действующий при Главном управлении по борьбе с торговлей людьми, были помещены 287 жертв преступлений, связанных с торговлей людьми. В отношении них приняты все необходимые меры по оказанию медицинской и психологической помощи, обеспечению необходимыми вещами для личного пользования. В дальнейшем 39 из них были обеспечены работой, 87 направлены на профессиональное обучение, а 28 оказана помощь в получении удостоверения личности. Отдельное внимание уделялось детям пострадавших. Более 100 таких детей были обеспечены учебными материалами со стороны Министерства внутренних дел, 
44 вовлечены в программу дошкольного образования, 54 обеспечены свидетельством о рождении, а в отношении 41 ребенка была оказана помощь в установлении отцовства и привлечении их к выплате алиментов. Благодарю за внимание. Mr. Commission, Mr. Chair, I uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Guleev, uh, for his uh, um, <clears throat> presentation and uh, contribution. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Chinggis Askarov, Deputy Chief of Supreme Court, to provide relevant information uh, on the questions raised by yesterday by Mr. Todd uh, Backwell. And uh, <clears throat> I would uh, like to ask you to address uh, the questions within the Article 125 of the uh, Criminal Procedural Court issue of uh, expulsions uh, carried out uh, in the, on the basis of diplomatic assurances, issue of uh, reliance on confessions, uh, court's approach to allegations on torture, uh, as well as cases related to Toplum TV, uh, Abzaz Media, and Sioux Blue. At the same time, uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Askarov, to reply on the question raised by Mr. Uh, Erdogan uh, Ishkan, uh, Ishkan related to domestic remedies. You have a floor, Mr. Askarov, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, distinguished Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, uh, I'd like to start with the short answers to questions and then uh, turn back to the practice of the uh, national courts of the Republic of Azerbaijan. According to the constitution of the, uh, of the Republic of Azerbaijan, all international uh, agreements adhered to by the Republic of Azerbaijan, including the international human rights instruments, have direct legal force on the whole territory of the state. And uh, therefore, as you might be aware, the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms is a, uh, is a, forms a part of our legislation, and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights also have uh, direct force in the Republic of Azerbaijan and widely uh, practicing by our courts. Uh, firstly, I'd like to... Uh, refer to the question of uh, examination of diplomatic assurances while examining the uh, question of expulsion of foreigners from the territory of Azerbaijan. According to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, these diplomatic assurances have some uh, importance, value for examination of such cases, but they don't have a decisive uh, value. Therefore, uh, in the practice of the, our courts, we, uh, while there are, uh, there are diplomatic assurances, they, are not, they don't have a decisive value and they are being examined together with other uh, circumstances of the case. If there are uh, any considerations of security for the foreigner uh, who is under the expulsion procedure, there are these diplomatic assurances might not be uh, taken into account. Uh, another question was uh, concerning the uh, ref uh, reference to uh, or examination by private doctors of the detainees. This question is also arising the practice of our uh, domestic national courts and also the law enforcement agencies also uh, be, is based on uh, the practice of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, I, I can assure you that uh, according to such practice, now we, uh, where any detainee asks for uh, examination by private doctor of his own uh, choose, then uh, this is ensured and uh, the private doctor is, uh, can, uh, have an access, has an access to detainee and provides forensic examination and gives a medical opinion uh, concerning his or her uh, state of health. These uh, cases, uh, a number of such cases were also submitted to the European Court of Human Rights, which uh, was, uh, the, they were taken into account. 
Uh, I'd like to draw your attention also to the decision of the plenum of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Azerbaijan of uh, this, uh, 24 December 2021 concerning the uh, judgment of the court in the criminal cases, which is also based on the uh, case law of the, human, of the European Court of Human Rights and addresses the whole range of uh, matters which can ar arise uh, in the criminal proceedings from the uh, arrest to the uh, delivery of the final judgment. And uh, several questions uh, raised by members of the committee will also have answer in this decision of the plenum. Uh, for example, the um, Article 125 and uh, the burden of proof, what are the uh, the proceedings when there are complaints or concerning or allegations concerning in treatment uh, uh, at the pretrial pre stage. The uh, practice of the national courts is based on the uh, <coughs> uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, I, I can, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, bring you an example of the approach of the European Court of Human Rights, which was, uh, expressed in each uh, uh, in its uh, recent decision uh, in the case of Ismailov versus Azerbaijan it is of February 2024 where the lawyer alleged that he was ill-treated uh, by the police uh, by the members of the police and uh, the court here I and I quote said uh, that uh, it cannot be said that the applicant raised an arguable claim or made a credible assertion. In view of that conclusion, it cannot be said that the authorities were under an obligation to investigate further the applicant's allegations. So the approach of national courts is the same. The, uh, the indi an individual have, has to bring arguable claim, at least any evidence or concordant evidences that he was ill-treated and then upon these claims, allegations, the court uh, starts investigation or on its own in the trial or it refers this investigation to the prosecutor's office, then waiting for the response of the prosecutor's office on the results of the investigation. Uh, the uh, concerning the reliance of the uh, criminal proceedings on the confessions by the uh, detainees, this question is, has been also addressed in the decision of the plenum of the Supreme Court, and it says that uh, the court judgment can only be based on the evidence investigated directly during the trial. That means that any uh, discrepancy in the, in the statements by the accused or by witnesses given uh, be at the pretrial stage or during the trial should be investigated only during the trial and be uh, examined together with other concordant or descending evidences. Uh, the complaints procedure, uh, I told about it, it's, it's uh, uh, being also here described. Uh, uh, the question of domestic remedies of the victims of uh, ill treatment. The courts, uh, according to our legislation and also to the practice of the courts, any individual who, who, has, been, uh, he, uh, who, who has been established as a victim of ill treatment has a right to, uh, to uh, remedy his violated rights and uh, we uh, not only the victim of ill treatment, by all, but also those who uh, were uh, unlawfully arrested or who were arrested uh, during the pretrial stage and then were acqu acquitted by the court, they have the right to compensation. Besides, the criminal court establishes the responsibility of those who are uh, Respons responsible for ill treatment. 
Therefore, we have uh, the cases. Uh, these are these are uh, these complaints or claims are being examined within the civil proceedings, and uh, we already have several cases or judgments when the victims of uh, unlawful arrest they received uh, uh, financial compensation or even the victims of ill treatment, they also receive uh, compensation for pecuniary or non-pecuniary damage. There were also uh, questions concerning uh, certain individuals of uh, civ uh, civil uh, society members and uh, the social media journalists and their arrests. This, uh, I can only say that these arrests are not, are not connected or related in any uh, event to their professional activities, and they were, uh, were brought to criminal responsibilities for uh, financial uh, offenses, in particular the smuggling of uh, money in uh, large amounts this is concerning the Abzas Media and Toplum. Concerning uh, Gubada Badoglu, he was uh, brought to criminal responsibility for uh, uh, financial fraud, and uh, he, uh, it was during the search in his place, it was found about 20,000 of, of false uh, United States dollars and this, therefore he was also brought to criminal responsibility. By, uh, uh, I also would like to note that several persons, including those who were, uh, whose names were mentioned yesterday, they applied to the European Court of Human Rights with the request for application of interim measures under Rule 39 of the Rules of Court to uh, referring, uh, alleging their uh, poor health conditions and uh, to respond to the courts, European courts uh, request, the authorities uh, organized independent medical examination, forensic examination of the individuals and presented, submitted to the court all the medical documentation of these individuals and the court uh, rejected application of interim measures. And uh, the day before yesterday, Gubade Badoglu was uh, uh, pretrial arrest was uh, re uh, <coughs> remitted to the house arrest. I think these are the questions which I should respond. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you, uh, Deputy Chief of the Supreme Court, Mr. Rascara, for your uh, valuable uh, contribution uh, to the today's uh, <coughs> discussions. And I now uh, wanted to turn to the. Uh, to Madam uh, Sadagat Gahramanova, uh, Deputy Chair of the State Committee for Family, Women and uh, Children Affairs, uh, to address the uh, issues uh, related to the activities on combating domestic and general-based violence and effective protection mechanism existing in the country, uh, as well as the corporal punishment of children and training activity. You have the floor, Madam Gahramanova, please. Спасибо. Уважаемый господин председатель, члены комитета, уважаемые участники сессии, я приветствую вас всех. Конвенция против пыток и других жестоких, бесчеловечных и унижающих достоинства видов обращения и наказания – это прежде всего защита прав человека, права женщин, мужчин, детей. Закон Азербайджанской Республики о гендерных гарантиях, гендерном равенстве – гарантирует защиту прав человека, включение гендерного фактора во все сферы жизни общества. Государственный комитет представляет годовой отчет парламента республики об исполнении данного закона, что дает возможность осуществлять гендерный анализ как в государственных структурах, так и в частном секторе. Во всех органах местного самоуправления созданы гендерные комиссии, для осуществления мониторинга среди семей и формирования гендерных взаимоотношений в семьях 
выявление фактов насилия и других факторов, унижающих достоинство человека. В стране функционирует закон по бытовому насилию. Указом президента Азербайджанской Республики был утвержден национальный план действий по борьбе с бытовым насилием 2020-2023 годы. В целях обеспечения реализации мер, предустановленных национальным планом, во всех органах исполнительной власти созданы мониторинговые группы по гендерному насилию и насилию в отношении детей. Мониторинговые группы действуют во всех районах страны куда входят представители районных полицейских управлений, прокуратуры, структуры образования, здравоохранения и социальных структур. При выявлении фактов насилия виновные наказываются в соответствующем законодательном порядке. Помимо оказания помощи подвергшемуся насилию, с прошлого года ведется работа с лицами, совершенными факт насилия. И ведется реабилитация детей, находящихся в условиях процесса насилия. В выступлении докладчика был поднят вопрос о подготовке сотрудников правоохранительных органов в деле предотвращения гендерного и бытового насилия. В рамках проекта «Твининг» в 2021 году было обучено и обеспечено сертификатами 696 сотрудников правоохранительных органов. Кроме того, более 300 сотрудниками полиции был проведен 20-часовой обучающий курс по домашнему и гендерному насилию и оценке рисков. Образовательные информационные мероприятия были проведены во всех образовательных учреждениях. Был задан вопрос о состоянии горячих линий. За 2020 год была открыта горячая, 20 -го года была открыта горячая линия 860, куда поступило 1115 обращений, 915, 915 от женщин и 200 от мужчин. Кроме того, действует детский и женский телефон доверия 117 и 111. Также был поднят вопрос о состоянии сексуального насилия. Одним из приоритетов гос... государственной политики являются трудовые права человека. Доля женщин в составе экономически активного населения составляет 48,3%. В прошлом году комитетом было проведено исследование о положении сексуального насилия. Фактов насилия не было зарегистрировано, но сегодня ведется большая разъяснительная и профилактическая работа в этом направлении. С целью содействия развития экономических прав предпринимательских навыков женских, э, сельских женщин реализуется проект технической помощи. В рамках проекта были созданы женские ресурсные центры в регионах страны. Эти центры помогают предотвращать бытовое и гендерное насилие путем преодоления социально-экономических проблем, с которым сталкиваются женщины. В целом 8200 женщин были вовлечены в тренинги и мероприятия на различные темы, проводимые женскими ресурсными центрами. Около 824 женщин начали свой бизнес. Также хотела бы проинформировать вас о вопросах, касающихся защиты прав детей. В целях обеспечения выполнения плана действий по реализации детской стратегии на 2020-2025 годы подготовлен новый проект – Закона о правах детей. В проект включены правовые нормы о телесных наказаниях в отношении детей. Также в Кодекс Азербайджанской Республики о административных правонарушениях предусмотрено определение санкций к родителям, принимающим телесные наказания или работникам образовательных, медицинских, социальных служб, спортивных, культурных, оздоровительных и других аналогичных учреждений, ответственных за детей. Подготовлен законопроект о несовершеннолетних. То оба проекта находятся на стадии согласования с государственными органами. Согласно статье 12 закона о правах ребенка, ребенок имеет право на свободу и личную неприкосновенность. Любое физическое и юридическое лицо, наблюдающее случаи жесткого обращения с детьми, может обратиться в соответствующие органы с просьбой предотвратить такое обращение. 
Женское обращение с детьми, применение к ним морального и физического насилия влечет за собой лишение родительских прав в соответствии с законодательством Азербайджанской Республики, а также административную и уголовную ответственность. Был затронный значит, в сотрудничестве с Министерством юстиции и Управлением пенсионной службы проводится систематическая работа с детьми, находящимися в воспитательных учреждениях. Проводятся мероприятия по здоровому образу жизни, встреча с родителями, ведется лекции о правах ребенка. Дети в день открытых дверей и встреча с их ровесниками. Также в настоящее время в учреждении пенсионной службы отбывают наказания около 500 женщин. Их семейные проблемы и проблемы, связанные с детьми, находятся на постоянном контроле Комитета по проблемам семьи женщин и детей. Часть детей, конечно, находится в семьях, в детских учреждениях, а есть дети, которые живут рядом с матерьми. Женщины обращаются в комитет, постоянно обращаются в комитет по различным социальным вопросам. Социальные вопросы – это вопросы пензии, инвалидности и другие. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо, raised uh, yesterday by uh, Madame Anna Rakum. Please, you have the floor, sir. Благодарю, уважаемый председатель, уважаемые члены комитета, дамы и господа. Вначале я хотел бы отметить, что Конституция Азербайджанской Республики и закон об охране здоровья населения гарантируют каждому равенство прав на охрану здоровья и медико-социальную помощь независимо от расы, этнической принадлежности, религии, языка, пола, происхождения, имущественного и служебного положения, убеждений и политической и социальной принадлежности. Отвечая на вопрос госпожи Рачу по психиатрической клинике номер один, Хотелось бы отметить, что э, это одна из крупнейших психиатрических клиник э, с, с, с длительной историей, э, многолетней. И э, там проводятся ремонтные работы в одном и двух корпусах, которые должны быть закончены в этом году. Э, по поводу усмирительных был вопрос э, мер. Э, сегодня э, при Наличие опасности э, со стороны пациента, самому себе и окружающим пациентам, он может изолироваться на короткое время. Никаких механических приспособлений для этого не используется, так как сегодня э, в Азербайджане, как и во всем мире, имеется лекарственная терапия. Э, по поводу недостатков психиатров, спасибо за вопрос. Это в мире тенденция и в развитых странах. Учитывая, я не хочу э, отнимать ваше время, э, но должен э, констатировать, что профессиональное выгорание психиатров э, и э, где-то влияет на недостаток психи психиатров во всем мире. И Министерство здравоохранения совместно с университетом мы работаем над этим, привлекаем студентов, создаем интерес, повышаем статус психиатров. Возможно, и э, какие-то э, надбавки региональные, возможно, к заработной плате. Это тоже надо учитывать. И надеемся э, на определенный сдвиг. Э, при этом э, Азербайджан участвует в Министерстве здравоохранения совместно Всемирной организации здравоохранения в программе Mental, Mental Health GAP. И, в принципе, мы надеемся улучшить ситуацию с недостатком специалистов. 
немного опустив обращение на первичную, на поликлиническую службу. На поликлиническую службу это используется во многих странах. Также, продолжая тему предыдущего оратора Садегатхану, у нас функционирует детский психоневрологический центр, который оказывает медицинскую помощь детям, страдающим заболеванием психоневрологического профиля. В целях обеспечения доступа к медицинским и психологическим услугам для детей с ограниченными возможностями, в том числе и аутистического спектра, Министерство здравоохранения посредством сотрудничества с местными неправительственными организациями, которые являются членами общественного совета, так и по информации, поступившей на детскую горячую линию, телефон 116-111, оперативно предпринимает соответствующие меры. Центр психического здоровья совместно с Университетом Чикаго США с 2020 года проводит проект по оказанию психологической помощи и психосоциальной реабилитации детей возвращающихся в свои семьи из школ, интернатов. До сих пор в рамках проекта аналогичные услуги были оказаны почти 400 семьям. Проект продолжаться будет до 2025 года. Также Центр общественного здоровья и реформ регулярно проводит профессионалистические мероприятия в социальных сетях с целью снижения стигмы, дискриминации, и барьеров в отношении людей с ограниченными возможностями, психическими заболеваниями, как для населения, так и для медицинского персонала. Параллельно отвечая на вопрос госпожи Раку, я хотел бы сказать, что в психиатрической клинике медперсонал каждые три месяца проводятся тренинги по от, э, взаимоотношениям с пациентом и так далее. В случае нарушения, в случае нарушения э, я должен э, констатировать, что э, есть закон, э, правила и нормы этического поведения медработников в Азербайджанской республике, регулируются приказом министра здравоохранения номер 137 об утверждении правил этического поведения врачей и, соответственно, медперсонала с 11, 2011 года. Все жалобы на жестокое обращение в отношении лиц, в том числе детей с умственными и нарушениями в психиатрических учреждениях, являются предметом оперативного разбирательства соответствующего департамента Министерства здравоохранения. Клиника, кстати, подчиняется Министерству здравоохранения. В предыдущие годы на основании этих жалоб лица, допустившие грубо отношения с пациентами, уволены. Занимаемые должности. Также необходимо отметить по проблеме у нас в Азербайджане в рамках реализации государственной программы по борьбе с незаконным оборотом наркотических средств, психотропных веществ и их прекурсоров и борьбе с наркоманией 19-24 год, Минздрав проводит ряд работ. В Республиканском наркологическом центре начало функционировать отделение амбулаторной реабилитации. Планируется организовать аналогичное отделение в других наркологических медицинских учреждениях страны. Помимо этого, в сотрудничестве с представителями гражданского общества проводится расширение программы заместительной терапии среди потребителей инъекционных наркотиков. На сегодняшний день в городе Баку и в городе Сумгаите существуют эти центры достаточно эффективно и планируется расширение также по поводу 
вопросов по поводу туберкулеза. Принятый в стране закон о борьбе с туберкулезом и также решения, приказы и инструкции Министерства здравоохранения создают нормативно-правовую базу для борьбы с туберкулезом. Также в результате мер, принятых в соответствии со стратегией Всемирной организации здравоохранения по ликвидации туберкулеза, ситуация с туберкулезом стала стабильной, хотя, безусловно, требуются дальнейшие усилия. Министерством здравоохранения определены специальные специализированные больницы для диагностики и лечения лекарственно устойчивых форм туберкулеза. Это одна из проблем, безусловно. Создана полностью оснащенная лабораторная сеть в пяти регионах. Также национальная референс-лаборатория. В результате оснащения данных микробиологической лаборатории современным оборудованием улучшилась диагностика лекарственно устойчивого туберкулеза с помощью экспресс-молекулярных тест-систем. Все больные обеспечиваются противотуберкулезными препаратами первого и второго ряда. Также э, существуют девятимесячные схемы, шестимесячные. Э, также э, каждый выявленный больной с туберкулезом имеет возможность немедленно подключаться к необходимому режиму лечения. Э, должен отметить, что это бесплатно. Для этого в стране есть все необходимые препараты и методы ежемесячного мониторинга лечения. Основным условием является амбулаторное лечение. В процессе лечения больному выдается денежное пособие по больничному листу о временной нетрудоспособности. Далее по проблеме СПИДа. ВИЧ-инфицированных, также государственная программа в Азербайджане, и мы активно работаем и следуем рекомендациям Всемирной организации здравоохранения по принципу «treat all» – лечить каждого. В стране успешный опыт профилактики передачи вируса от матери к ребенку. За последние годы не зафиксированы случаи заражения ребенка от матери. В стране применяются активные шаги по реализации призыва ВОЗ и УНАЙЦ 95-95-95. То есть 95% больных из зараженных, привлеченные 95% и снижение вирусной нагрузки до неопределяемого уровня 95% получающих лечение. Также лицам, подвергнувшимся насилию, насилию и другим насильственным действиям, вызывающим опасность заражения ВИЧ-инфекцией, проводятся меры, меры по, до контакт, после контактной профилактики. Также я должен отметить, в 2023 году Азербайджан сертифицирован Всемирной организацией здравоохранения как страна, свободная от малярии. В заключение отмечу, что мультисекторальный подход к решению задач, поставленной конвенцией, является основой, основной прерогативой для более эффективной и результативной имплементации. Мы приветствуем усилия комитета поддержки стран по достижению столь гуманной цели. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо, to address some uh, points within uh, your uh, competences, and then uh, followed by uh, Mr. Vusavaliyev, Chief Assistant to the Prosecutor General. 
uh, to inform the audience on the training activity and to provide some statistical data. Mr. Uh, Galijev, you have the floor, please. Спасибо, уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые члены комитета, уважаемые коллеги. Довожу до вашего сведения, что 14 октября 2023 года генеральный прокурор Азербайджанской республики и министр внутренних дел подписали совместный приказ в целях всестороннего обеспечения защиты прав подозреваемых и обвиняемых своевременного предотвращения пыток и бесчеловечного обращения, а также обеспечения эффективной борьбы с ними. Согласно этому приказу, в связи с производством следственных действий вместе удаленным от жилого массива, где расположен следственный изолятор, задержанный, может быть переведен из следственного изолятора в место временного содержания только в исключительных случаях. Это следственные действия, которые не могут быть произведены в следственном изоляторе. Очная ставка. Следственный эксперимент, проверка показаний на месте и так далее. Все следственные действия, которые могут быть произведены в следственном изоляторе с участием арестованных, а также после доставки обвиняемых в изолятор временного содержания, не должны содержаться там без надобности. При наличии соответствующих условий для проведения допросов только в комнате для допросов принять не, приняты необходимые меры для обеспечения того, чтобы предварительные допросы подозреваемых и обвиняемых в совершении тяжких и особо тяжких преступлений проводились с использованием видеозаписи полностью отображающих помещение, где проводится допрос и очная ставка. Во время видеозаписи от начала до окончания следственных действий, а также участие и фиксации фамилий, званий и обязанностей всех участвующих лиц, как правило, допросы должны проводиться не более чем двумя лицами, что посторонние не должны находиться в комнате для допроса во время допроса, за исключением лиц, участвующих в целях обеспечения необходимых мер безопасности, что допрос должен производиться не более двух часов без перерыва, должны быть приняты необходимые меры для обеспечения своевременного проведения расследования фактов пыток или жестокого обращения с подозреваемыми и обвиняемыми в случае выявления нарушений при составлении протокола осмотра лиц, находящихся в следственных изоляторах и изоляторах временного содержания, неполноты сведений, отраженных в протоколе, а также информирование медицинского персонала, работавшего в тюрьмах и пенитенциарных учреждениях. Независимо от наличия или отсутствия жалобы о пытках и других незаконных действиях должностного лица, в ходе предварительного следствия от лица, подвергшегося пыткам его родственников или иного другого лица, незамедлительно предоставление в прокуратуре информации о каждом факте, обнаруженном сотрудниками прокуратуры, с самими следственными органами, запросов государственных органов и международных организаций, а также опубликованные в средствах массовой информации и, и направление соответствующих материалов в прокуратуру для расследования с целью недопущения расследования таких сведений и фактов в органах полиции, за исключением 
служебного расследования. И решением колени Генеральной прокуратуры Азербайджанской Республики от 30 июля 2020 года в целях проверки правонарушений, совершенных сотрудниками прокуратуры при исполнении служебных обязанностей на основании правил организации работы Генеральной прокуратуры Азербайджанской Республики в соответствии с пунктом 32 была создана дисциплинарная комиссия Генеральной прокуратуры Азербайджана, которая рассматривает собранные материалы по проверке нарушений исполнительной и трудовой дисциплины. Это специальное учреждение, созданное с целью рассмотрения вопроса о дисциплинарной ответственности работников прокуратуры путем дачи заключения и применения дисциплинарных взысканий. Эта комиссия рассматривает материалы, собранные в результате служебных проверок или комплексной проверки работников прокуратуры в дисциплинарном производстве на основе принципов законности, коллегиальности, справедливости, беспристрастности и объективности. И по результатам представляет генеральному прокурору представление. После рассмотрения представления комиссия генерального Комиссии генеральный прокурор решает вопрос о дисциплинарной ответственности лица, в отношении которого ведется дисциплинарное производство и издает соответствующий приказ. Проверка полученной информации о случаях пыток, унижающих достоинство обращения или наказания в соответствии со статьей 207 Уголовного процессуального кодекса Азербайджанской Республики возложена на э, управление служебных расследований. Хочу отметить, что в республике на сегодняшний день проверкой э, такой информации занимается только лишь вот это управление служебных расследований, которое э, подчиняется только генеральному прокурору. Соглас, согласно изменениям, утвержденным эт, этим решением, вот э, как я отметил, этим занимается только управление по служебных расследований. После этого я хочу передать слово нашему коллеге, помощник, старшему помощнику генерального прокурора товарищ Али. Thank you. I'd like to submit uh, a few information regarding the data on cases in which during the period under review officials have been disciplined for failing to respect the rights of detainees. From 2020 to 2024, disciplinary proceedings were initiated against 102 prosecution employees for violating the rights of suspects and accused persons for procrastination and for not properly performing their duties. Of these, six individuals were dismissed from their prosecution authorities, 66 employees were reprimanded, 18 were warned, and 12 were removed from their positions. Excluding the prosecution, internal investigations were ordered for 70 individuals from other law enforcement agencies due to violations committed. Additionally, I'd like to give some information regarding the uh, CPT report. A number of cases mentioned in the report adopted at the 111th meeting of the Committee for the Prevention of Torture in Human and Degrading Treatment or Punishment of the Council of Europe held on July 2023 were reviewed. Two criminal cases have been initiated pertaining to the mentioned facts under Article 309 of the Criminal Code, which addresses the issue of exceeding official powers and one case has been remanded for further investigation after the decision was annulled. And also regarding the information on training programs in uh, Prosecutor General's office, in recent uh, years, the Science and Education Center of the Prosecutor General's office has conducted numerous educational and enlightening events for the employees of the prosecution and other law enforcement agencies. The trainings primarily focused on the following topics. Consideration of modern in the international practices during the restriction of the right to freedom in the context of criminal prosecution. 
combating torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, adherence to legislation, human rights, and civil liberties during operational search activities, the principle of superior protection of children's rights during criminal prosecution, accessibility of women to justice, uh, cases evaluated as gross violations of the right to defense during preliminary investigations, issues arising from international conventions on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination, application of the principles on effective interviewing for investigations and information gathering based, based on Mendes principles during the interrogation of individuals. More than 1,300 employees of law enforcement agencies as well as over 220 newly recruited employees of the prosecution have participated in these trainings. Thank you. I sincerely thank you, uh, Mr. Galejev and Mr. Aliyev, uh, for your uh, uh, <coughs> replies uh, to the, uh, some of the questions raised yesterday and for your general uh, contribution to the, today's meeting. And now I want to give the floor to uh, Mr. Adil uh, Abilev, head of the International Cooperation Department of the Ministry of Justice, uh, who will address some of the points raised by uh, Mr. Todd uh, uh, Backworld and Anna Raku. Uh, and the, uh, he will address some issues related to Article 40 and uh, 293 of the criminal court, particularly in the context of uh, severity of the penalties, as well as uh, Article 75 uh, of the same court. Uh, he will also refer to, uh, the, um, uh, to the issues of uh, expulsions of the, on the basis of diplomatic assurances. Um, uh, that issue was, uh, in some part, was addressed by the changes uh, Askarev, um, he will uh, provide some additional information. He also will um, um, inform the audience about the um, issues relating to the Istanbul Protocol, conditions in uh, penitentiary facilities, overcrowding of the prisons, medical staff matters, vocational activity, and children in conflict with law. Mr. Habilov, you have the floor to address all these extensive questions. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sharifov, uh, distinguished chairman, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Sharifov has already outlined the, uh, actually the points, the bullet points that I, I'm supposed to talk, and uh, that was, as, as you've heard, very extensive one, but indeed, uh, yesterday, uh, the a number of issues raised by the rapporteurs uh, really do fell under the jurisdiction of the Minister of Justice. So I would like to start with Madame Raku's questions and uh, I will try to be brief, uh, but yet we still have uh, extensive information to submit. And uh, indeed, as Madame Raku mentioned, Azerbaijan and Moldova, they, have, uh, they share common Soviet legacy. And we understand uh, that uh, these problems with the prison conditions shall be duly addressed. And uh, that is actually uh, on, the, on the governmental level that there is a political will in Azerbaijan to reform the penitentiary. Actually, Azerbaijan was one of the first countries on the post-Soviet era who transferred prisons from the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Interior to the jurisdiction of the Minister of Justice. And uh, the, another problem that we faced was that actually the majority of prisons, the vast majority of the prisons, they were located in Baku, in the capital. And uh, it was really difficult for the relatives from the regions to come and see their relatives and so on. So basically, uh, one of the elements uh, of the penitentiary reform was to build new uh, prisons which meet uh, best practices and European standards. The other one was uh, to do, to carry out this work, not in the capital, but also in the regions, so that uh, the uh, prisoners, they can serve their sentences close to their families, which would further, obviously, serve to their better social adaptation and reintegration back into the society. 
uh, in this direction, the number of legislative, institutional, and practical actions have been taken. And when it comes to infrastructure, I would like to say that uh, in the, within the like uh, last three years, we built new prison for females. So the other, the prison, the old prison. Number four, which was cited by Madame Raku and was also cited by one, in one of the CPT reports, it ceased to exist, so it's no longer exists anymore. And uh, also, we built a new prison for juveniles. Uh, that was done both uh, in 2022. In 2023, it was built a prison which replaced Kobustan prison. Uh, which also reported not really good having not really good conditions. Now we have a new prison, and I would like to specifically add that that prison was built uh, with the recommendations of the CPT. We even asked members of the CPT when they were visiting Azerbaijan to uh, visit this prison, maybe to provide some additional recommendations that we can use while the prison was still under construction, which was done by the members, and uh, f later on we used them. And the most modern achievement that Mr. Sharif also mentioned in his opening speech was the uh, uh, introduction of a new uh, mixed-regime penitentiary institution in Lankaran. This is the region in the south of Azerbaijan, close to the border with Iran. and. Uh, uh, it's also a brand new prison and the facility, and uh, another another tangible element, tangible example of the political will in in, in this area is that president of our country, we, while visiting this region, he also specifically went to see the conditions created uh, by, for the for prisoners. And it was broadcasted, of course, by uh, TV media and spread with the photos and videos so that all the uh, public in Azerbaijan they are aware what are the conditions nowadays provided to, to prisoners. Uh, and another thing that um, Madame Raku mentioned is, was the uh, problem with the Ganja pretrial detention facility. In this regard, I'd like also to mention that uh, there is a construction of new also penitentiary institution, mixed one, which will absorb uh, pre-trial detention facility and the facility itself, so kind of prison, is uh, under construction in Ganja. 47% uh, of the construction has already been done, so basically, hopefully, with the proper funding, we can also uh, finish the construction of it within the coming years. And uh, what the, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, four square meters that you mentioned, Madame Racco, as well. Of course, all these uh, facilities, they provide minimum uh, four square meters per person, excluding sanitary facilities. Uh, then uh, I would like to mention another issue that uh, you raised. Uh, by the way, we also, uh, I mean, if, along with building new prisons, we also uh, spending money on uh, repairing, repairing of the old ones, uh, s including the uh, Shuvalan pretrial detention that you mentioned, also which also located in in Baku. Uh, another another issue that you mentioned is the staff member. If you basically, if you look into the reports of the Council of Europe, there is a common problem with the staff members uh, in, in in many countries, uh, including medical doctors, and uh, we also understand this, this problem. And just for your information, since 2020, the, num the staff number increased by 12% in the penitentiary, uh, including 4% of female staff. And uh, this year, we asked also for extra staff, uh, so hopefully we'll get more this year as well. Uh, regarding the, thing, the issue that was mentioned by the subcommittee of torture while the, they were visiting uh, Nachman, uh, that you mentioned that there was only one female uh, uh, guard in, in there. Uh, nowadays, uh, it was easy to check because the facility is not so big and not so many prisoners are currently are serving their sentences. So nowadays, there are eight female uh, prison guards. But you also you need to take into account there are only six female prisoners in there at the moment. 
Regarding the uh, budget allocations, also, uh, of course, it's a common problem. I mean, when, when uh, you discuss the issue of allocation, allocating money with the Minister of Finance, obviously prisoners are not in the top spot. Yet, Minister of Justice, we are trying to uh, work in this direction. And uh, since 2020, uh, the budget allocated to the penitentiary system and the uh, amount of money uh, allocated per person, per prisoner, uh, both uh, increased by 1.6 times. And uh, also, we have a gradual increase in the quality of the medical assistance in prisons and pre-trial detention facilities. Uh, as uh, Mr. Askarov mentioned uh, earlier, uh, when it is needed, we can invite uh, medical doctors from civil sector. Uh, we can uh, send uh, the particular person outside to the civil sector hospital uh, to carry out specific surgery, which is, for instance, not possible to be carried out inside the uh, prison facility. Or if a person wants a specific surgeon or doctor to carry out this operation. Uh, I would like to specifically mention the fighting TB in prisons because I believe that we have uh, some developments that are worth to be shared. And it's not uh, our opinion, it's the opinion of the ICRC and the Global Fund, which we have been working for many, many years. We started to address this problem since 1995. And at that time, uh, it was really a huge challenge for those who were uh, sentenced, because as you mentioned, the old barrack type uh, prison, it really provides a huge risk of to be, to be spread drastically. According to the World Health Organization analysis, uh, the risk of the to be, to be spread inside the prisons is 100 times higher than in the civil sector. So we uh, started to work with the uh, ICRC and just I'll, in kind of bullet points, I will try to highlight the developments, the achievements that we have at the moment. Uh, first of all, uh, when a person arrives to a prison, we have a gen, exp gen expert uh, equipment, which helps uh, to test a person in 100 minutes that, uh, that whether a person is infected with TB or not. Then uh, we, since 2009, we not only treat uh, prisoners inside the prison, but also we follow up once they are released, but the medical treatment is not over, we still do the follow up uh, once they are free, in the freedom. And we also cooperate in, uh, in this area with various NGOs. Uh, just to uh, figure out the results that we reached, uh, if the w WHO sets the 90% uh, uh, threshold for the positive treatment uh, of normal TB, we have 96%. When it comes to multi-resistant form of tuberculosis, it's the 85% according to the World Health Organization, whereas we have 88. And uh, just for you to compare, if you compare the number of deaths in prison since 1990, with 1995 and 2023, the death rate went down by 169 times. 169 times. When you compare uh, 2013 with 2023, it's three times less. And just for you, for as an example, last year we had only eight cases eight deaths out of uh, the tuberculosis, but all of them, they were aggravated by the uh, other diseases like HIV and hepatitis. Uh, since, I mean, thanks to these results, positive results, World Health Organization since 2014 established the Collaborating Center for TB Control in Prisons in Baku, just very close aside to the uh, specific special medical facilities for TB uh, prisoners. And it, it's got uh, international status. It was two times prolonged, last time in 2022, for extra four years. So what the, tra what the, what the center does, it, it provides training for uh, 
TB control in prison system uh, from different countries. Since its establishment, uh, we had around 200 training activities, which were joined by 2,600 of participants from Africa, Asia, Europe, and even South America. Representatives of 21 states visited uh, our TB facility and this center to study the best practices we've got, including representatives, not only the Minister of Justice, but also the Minister of Interior, Minister of Health, and representatives of the civil sector. And I would like to know that uh, some of the countries, they are represented also here, like we have the visitors from Moldova, China, Turkey, and many others. Uh, regarding the uh, psychological uh, care in, uh, in the in psychiatric care in, 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 in prison, it's really an issue. And it's not only as uh, our Deputy Minister of Health mentioned that it's uh, a, a common challenge, not only in prisons, but also in the civil sector. Uh, we, are, uh, we have very good assistance with the Council of Europe, with the European Union. We had a number of projects held together on training in this area. We had even Turkish psycho psychiatric uh, uh, prof professors visiting Azerbaijan to do training of trainers. So we're also understanding the problem. We're working in this area as well. Regarding another issue uh, on the alternative measures, as you rightly mentioned, we had a decree of the president of dated 2017, which uh, set up a number of uh, actions and uh, tasks uh, to, to be done in terms of the reducing overcrowding and uh, applying alternative sanctions. Since then, uh, we had a probation service established in Azerbaijan. So the decree was dated 2017. In 2018, the probation service was, uh, was established. We uh, started best practices with different countries, even our neighbors and some others, to see how fast we can uh, let this uh, service grow. Because in, uh, to be honest, in some countries, uh, the probation of services were for, at first stage only allowed to uh, minors. In some countries, it also it only can only be done voluntarily. So the uh, accused persons they were kind of getting an option whether to go to prison for a less uh, number of years, like let's say for a year or two years in probation, and they were choosing prison instead. Just a couple of uh, figures. Uh, since the establishment of the probation service, we uh, used around 20,000 bracelets. Because according to the uh, change into the legislation, we had introduced a new sanction, uh, limitation of liberty. And uh, the bracelets, this electronic monitoring is being used uh, for this particular execution, for this particular uh, punishment. Uh, apart from that, uh, the probation officers, they are dealing, dealing with community works, with the uh, correction works, with fines, and so on. So currently, our probation service has under supervision a bit over than 24,000 persons. Apart from that, as a part, uh, as an as a element of the humanization of the legislation in Azerbaijan, we had like three stages, 2017, 2018, and the last one, 2020, a number of uh, over about like 35 uh, crimes, they were decriminalized. Uh, some crimes were had their sanctions uh, increased, so that uh, that really affected the prison population in terms of uh, reviewing their sentences and even releasing a number of people. And uh, just for your information, this, uh, uh, due to these reforms, about 6,000 prisoners, they were released. Uh, they were covered, including uh, 1,216 uh, were released in 2020. Also, we are uh, widely using release, release on parole. Uh, we never stopped doing that even during the COVID period, uh, ha uh, making benefit of the 
video conferencing uh, equipment that are equipped that are provided in all of our facilities so that uh, court proceedings can go on and uh, this very equipment helps us to uh, to to uh, do the interviews we have a special commission on the on the parole which also among officers of the Minister of Justice they also include uh, members of the NGO uh, and since 2020 uh, about uh, 11,000 prisoners, uh, they were released on parole, so without, within these uh, four years. Uh, among, amongst these other things, uh, also, as Minister uh, Sharif have mentioned, uh, amnesties and pardon acts in Azerbaijan is a kind of widespread practice. Uh, we had uh, 2,700 persons released from prisons uh, following the amnesty, and 1,385 1, persons were pardoned. And also, just for your information, uh, normally uh, in May we have in Independence Day, the uh, holiday in Azerbaijan, and normally at this stage we also uh, are expecting a, a new pardon decree. Uh, also, we, uh, another, another issue that we recently started to introduce is the restorative justice because in 2022 there was a uh, conference of the European Ministers of Justice in Venice, which was devoted specifically to this very issue. So we started to work on this, on this area, and uh, we even became a member of the European Forum on the restorative justice, uh, and we also work with the social agents, social services agency. Uh, I will not e elaborate on this issue because we have a colleague in, the, in our delegation who will further on uh, also speak about uh, this very thing that we're doing. But also a couple of uh, points that I would like to uh, note that uh, Madame Raku mentioned. Uh, regarding the juveniles, uh, we are, are now s stopped the practice of using the solitary confinement in the uh, juvenile facility. It was actually also the uh, recommendation of the CPT. And now we drafted an amendment to the legislation to uh, abolish it by law. Uh, also, uh, as during the last visit of uh, CPT to Azerbaijan, during the meeting, I'm not uh, like exposing the, the report, but during the meeting at the ministry, members of the CPT who visited female prison and juvenile prison, they said that uh, they had no single allegation. Uh, they didn't hear any single allegation about the torture facts in these two institutions. We also uh, started since using the IT, as I said, the, apart from the uh, video conferencing, we started to use and we changed the legislation to allow prisoners to use video meeting with their relatives. Uh, for 15 minutes, and also providing seven days vacations, uh, depending on the behavior of the prisoner, of course. And uh, when, comes, when it comes to juveniles and females, uh, we have a number of projects with the UNICEF, with a number of NGOs inside the prison regarding their vacational uh, training and so on. Uh, the they, interesting point for me as for instance, the person who is fond of football, many, many prisoners from, uh, not, not many, there are only actually 26 uh, juveniles in the, in the juvenile prison at the moment, they go out to watch football games. Uh, they, uh, we arranged even a game with the junior team of our best team, Karabakh, which qualified to the quarterfinals of the Europa League. So they, they had a game inside the prison with, with the junior team of this game, which was fun, which was very interesting, and I think they were honored to, to meet with these people. When it comes, they also have computer classes, language classes, but I believe this is a common practice. And in, as uh, Madame Gaharmanov also mentioned, we have open doors practice in both of these prisons. When they can meet their relatives, their peers, they do uh, some other activities together. And uh, also, uh, when it comes to females separately, I'd like to uh, know that we are now working with the, uh, several entrepreneurs to provide, uh, to ensure that these persons, when they're released, they can find uh, proper jobs. So, for instance, with a number of cleaning uh, companies, uh, we have a certificate-based uh, training 
uh, on the cleaning, and some of females who were released already, they are now working at several hotels doing cleaning, for instance. Uh, chefs also from several top restaurants in Azerbaijan, in Baku, basically in the capital, they do training on cooking for uh, many people, and then uh, also some of them are later on recruited after their release. Uh, uh, females even have their own music band, which is widely uh, uh, broadcasted uh, on TV as well. Uh, when it comes to the training activities, of course, it's very important to do the training, including the Istanbul Protocol. As you mentioned, Madame Rako, yes, indeed, training on the Istanbul Protocol, especially for uh, uh, members of the, our medical service, is mandatory. Within this period, since 2020, we had 10 trainings uh, for about 120 uh, medical staff, including uh, five over like 500 uh, other uh, professionals, like lawyers, and one, 122 judges and uh, 231 candidates. The difference between training for judges and the candidates is that uh, training for judges is vo voluntarily because we can't force a judge to go for a training. When it comes to judicial candidates, it's included in their curricula. Uh, so basically, uh, I believe that's it when it comes to the uh, questions of uh, Madame, raised by Madame Rako. When it comes to some several legislative issues uh, raised by uh, Mr. Buchwald, uh, I would like to note that indeed, as Mr. Buchwald suspected, when it comes to Article 40 of the Criminal Code, it is indeed a translation problem. And uh, the word obviously is not really reflecting the wording of the, of the article. So basically it should sound like, um, uh, let me quote the translation. Uh, the person who committed a deliberate crime by execution of illegal order or instruction, which he knew it is illegal or he should have known it is illegal, shall carry out the criminal responsibility in accordance with the general grounds. So it's not obviously, no one is deciding on this issue whether it's legitimate or not. When it comes to uh, Article 293 uh, uh, regarding the uh, definition of torture, uh, I would like to note that in, in, the, in the first paragraph, uh, the article speaks about the uh, harm not reaching the torture threshold. And, but when it comes to the sanction, uh, it's, well, one might say that it's a subjective view that the sanction is not that high, but if you look into the other criminal sanctions in the criminal court, like for instance, murder by negligence, or uh, murder in the state of uh, affect, it's almost the same section. However, when it comes to torture in the paragraph two, the sanction reaches maximum of eight years, which according to our legislation, based on the severity level, comes under the uh, understanding of the serious crime. For us, uh, when the sanction is over seven or over seven years, it means that the crime is serious and therefore it should be considered by a serious crimes court and not even an ordinary court. When it comes to the Article 75 on the lapse of time, well, indeed, it does apply to article, uh, the torture article. However, if you look into this art, uh, paragraph three of this article, it says that the person, if person is hiding from the investigation, the time flow shall be suspended. So basically, in practice, if the person is hiding, it's, uh, fugitive or running away, uh, it's not counted. So 12 years period for this particular type of crime, it's not uh, applicable in this particular case. Regarding the extradition, I believe I am uh, reaching the uh, time limit, but I still have some information regarding extradition and diplomatic assurances, so it's up to you, Chair, to decide whether should I continue or I can come back after the break. I thank you, uh, Mr. Rabilev, uh, for your detailed information. Uh, of course, we, we have some uh, issues which uh, we know that you wanted to share with the audience, but we are in the hands of uh, our chair uh, to decide whether we have a couple of minutes uh, that you will uh, finish your statement or... He can speak. So you, can, you can finish uh, on, on diplomatic assurance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Well, uh, when it comes to, uh, sorry taking <laughs> your break time, but yet, I mean, uh, we, we, uh, I'd like to raise a couple of issues regarding the diplomatic assurances. Indeed, uh, not only in expulsion cases, but also in extradition cases dealt uh, by the court in Azerbaijan, we do uh, use diplomatic assurances. And basically that goes both sides. So which means we require uh, when we see that there might be a risk uh, that the surrender of person or extradition of a person can uh, result can be resulted in torture. We do require diplomatic assurances, uh, and we do f sometimes ask even for post extradition monitoring by our consular services, or we ask uh, on the uh, from our partners the follow up information after the surrender. Uh, for instance, uh, just for your information, within the this period of time since 2020, we rejected extradition in two cases to Iran because of human rights situation in Iran regarding these particular persons. One actually was of Azerbaijani national, uh, national or, or, or origin, sorry. He was Iranian national, but uh, original Azerbaijani. And one case was regarding the rejection of his extradition uh, to Oman uh, of a Pakistani national. When it comes to us also, uh, we, uh, in one case of the uh, extradition to Thailand, of a person who was suspected in the uh, human trafficking, uh, national of Uzbekistan, we required uh, the assurances. Only after that, uh, we surrendered this person, but yet we uh, asked later on the, our Thai partners to provide the follow-up information of this person. Uh, and the same uh, case we had with India, uh, when we extradited a person to India according to the bilateral treaty, uh, we not only uh, asked for a general, I mean, human rights and torture uh, assurances, but also there was a risk that a person could be uh, sentenced to a death penalty because that was a murder case. So we asked specific guarantees that death penalty in this particular case was would not be executed as well. Uh, so basically that's that's what we do while we uh, consider extradition request. Also just one more minute of your time. Uh, we are uh, had a couple of fact finding mission coming from uh, different countries uh, during the extradition proceedings, namely Germany and UK, uh, who came to see our pretrial detention facilities and the prisons so that to make sure that the extradition of this particular person, the fugitive, would not violate his or her human rights. In both cases, uh, we, I mean, the, the defense, they didn't get anything, so the reports were positive. And after that, we got extradition uh, from, from both of the states. But it's not a common practice as far as I know, and not all states do allow this kind of fact-finding missions to come and see their prison facilities. However, uh, taking into account the uh, interest of Azerbaijan, first, on one hand, fighting uh, uh, serious crimes, and on the other hand, being balanced in terms of uh, ensuring human rights, we did that on, the, on our own intention. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Agradezco a la delegación sus eh, comentarios y respuestas a, a un buen número de preguntas que fueron formuladas el día de ayer. Y para seguir con este diálogo interactivo, le voy a ofrecer nuevamente la palabra a los eh, relatores. Tiene la palabra el señor Buchwald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Deputy Minister, and thank you for your delegation. There was a lot of um, information. It will take a little time to process some of it, um, but it's it's um, it's 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 you know, very important and very very sort of useful. I was going to go through sort of in tick point form a little bit, um, just to sort of get the questions out there, um, on um, or some questions out there, on. Um, 
I, I don't think I heard an answer to the question about whether you would consider releasing the European Com um, Committee on the Prevention of Torture and the and its report and our subcommittee's report. And um, it might not seem like the most important question in the world, but I think it actually is an important question because it goes to the issue of promoting transparency, um, having people have confidence that you're sort of being open and not sweeping things under the road. And I think there could be a lot of benefit I think there could be a lot of benefit in doing that. And you know, I don't know what's in them, and I'm sure there's criticism, but the criticism is part of the, um, you know, what's the word that, um, the phrase that um, sunlight is the best disinfectant. It, every one of those European com Committee reports will have criticism in it, and it's, um, it'll be, in my opinion, it'll be a, a, an important step forward to, um, 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 to, to allow for its publication. The, um, Sort of a little bit in the same vein, um, we had asked for statistical information on NGO registrations, and I know we had asked a lot of questions and you couldn't answer them all in the allotted time, but um, I think we had asked for year-by-year -year information on the number of NGOs that were um, registered since your last report, how many were denied, the grounds for denial, this kind of thing. And if it's possible, um, I think at the end of this, the chairman will say there's 48 hours of possibility of getting more information. If it's possible to get that information, I think that would be very, um, very helpful also. Um, on the, um, I did have one question about from your opening statement yesterday, which was an excellent opening statement. And um, I read it again overnight. Um, and it had the um, section on the, um, it says 705 police officers were subjected to disciplinary responsibility. And it sort of went on to say, for bringing citizens to the police offices without substantial reasons and their illegal detention. And then it said, as well as for rude and other degrading treatment. And I, I, it, it caught my eye because I've seen that phrase in other, you know, rude treatment is, um, I'm wondering if that's a translation. What does that mean, rude treatment? Is that torture, not torture, um, Article 16 violations? It's just not a phrase that I'm used to hearing. But I've seen it in other documents about Azerbaijan, so I think it must mean, have a meaning to you that isn't quite coming across in translation. So if you could um, clarify that. On the, um, on my question yesterday about the ICC, it, it's, it's an um, important question. You know, the ICC could be a sensitive issue for a lot of countries, but it's an important issue in the same kind of way of, um, in, the, in the sort of spirit of transparency. The, um, you know, as I said yesterday, I'm sitting here in Geneva, I'm getting information secondhand, including from you all, right? I'm hearing there's these investigations, that investigations, and, you know, it's not, um, 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 it, 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 it's not sort of forensic kind of information. And the thing about the ICC is it comes in and it does real work. And, you know, rarely, very few cases that are actually prosecuted, but it does real work. And it's in the, in the spirit of, um, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think it will, it will be sort of a useful and positive step. And you're in a position where the other side is saying, come on in. And, you know, it, it, um, it, it will, I think, be to your, hopefully, you'll see it as to your benefit if you can, um, either become a party, accept the jurisdiction, or promote its work in some way. I think that, that would be a positive step. Um, um, I'm sort of going through my list from yesterday. The, um, Mr. Askarov said that the, um, anyone who's ill-treated has a right to a remedy. I had asked yesterday about a particular version of that question, which was about Armenian POWs. Do they have a right to, um, a cl to pursue a claim in, in, um, as a Pajani court um, that they've been abused? Has anyone done it and won? And to do it, would you have to hire an Azerbaijani lawyer? So I don't know if it's possible to provide that information, but that would be um, interesting for me. Um, and I also don't think you got around to, and I know the time is short, but the, um, the cases about the renditions of, um, you know, where the, like our A and B, the case before our committee, the A and B case, where the person, and cases where the person was, um, um, you know, went to court, the court said don't extradite him, and then the next thing, he's sort of gone, the Hizmet cases. So if you have information on that or a reaction to it or steps that have been taken to, um, you know, guard against recurrence or whatever it is. Um, and then also, I think at the time, connected with that question, I'd asked a question about, right, so the, the A and B case, the case before our committee, involved also interim measures, right, that we had requested, which I think most countries regard as binding. So this person, we asked for interim measures, and the person was sort of um, rendered in that period when the interim measures were out there. So um, 
if you can, sort of provide information on how um, how you all deal with the request for interim measures. For how do you deal with our recommendations? Do you have a process that it goes through. It, you know, who's making the decision? Where I assume it goes from us to your mission, from your mission to Baku, and to Baku, there must be some process for dealing with this. And how is it dealt with? And um, and um, and actually, do you? I mean, it may be that you don't believe that there's an, um, a legal obligation. I mean, that's you know, it's. Um, I'm just trying to get more information about how you um, process all that and think about all that. Um, there are a couple more questions, but I think that that's more than. Um, oh, I was going to ask one um, um, particular question, which is. Um, so the discussion yesterday, the 23 people, right? Some say they're right POW, some say they're not POW, whatever. Um, the 23 people that remain, I, I think it's actually a much harder question. And I'm sure you've studied it more than I have, but to me it's a much harder question than they were captured after the war ended. That's, that's not the be all and end all of the analysis. And you know, if you, um, and especially when the question is whether they're terrorists. And I think the statement we yesterday was they're terrorists in accordance with international conventions. And I don't think that's correct. I think the, there is no international, one single international terrorism convention. The one that's the closest, which is that will probably apply here, is the terrorist bombing convention. And it specifically says that if you're military, you're not covered by it at all, no matter what. So it is sort of a complicated question. Um, and it's probably, it's way too much to go through, you, you know, to go through here um, this afternoon for sure. But I was wondering whether, besides the 23 that are still held, there were more people there before. And what, who, who were they? And why, who was returned? And what was the rationale for returning them? Um, presumably, they were picked up on the same kind of terrorism charges. So how did it, how did it, how did it end up that these 23 are still held? What, I don't know how many there were originally. What were the circumstances of, the, of their return? Um, these kind of things, I think, would help me um, process what is, what to make, what's going on. Um, and if I could, the, um, well, I guess it's really um, big tick points. The questions I was going to ask yesterday, one was about compilation of statistical data. And the short version of the question is, there were a lot of questions in the, um, our list of issues prior to reporting and then your um, report, where we asked for statistical data, and it really wasn't there. I mean, in fairness, it really wasn't there. And um, you know, my point today is not to say that in criticism. My point today is to sort of ask if you have, is there, um, um, to us it's very important, and our view is it's important to you, to countries that, you know, to compile it, and are there prospects for, um, enhancing your ability to col compile it and analyze it, because I think the compilation and analysis of statistical data is is a great way to sort of ferret out where problems are that aren't really being foreseen, you know, under, um, appreciated. You, it, it reveals all kinds of, th you know, it's oh my God, there's 27 cases over there and no, none other, none over here. I think it's a really valuable um, transparency, um, a step forward on transparency, and then. Um, Oh, I did want to ask about um, one other topic, which was LGTBI persons. And um, there, are, um, there are lots of sort of issues, right? The, um, th and there's lots of criticisms that have been out there, um, that there are, laws aren't, there are no laws on the books specifically protecting them, that um, there are hate crimes that are not prosecuted and so forth. There's um, a lot of online sort of um, hate that's not um, Moderated, and that the um, and that the police themselves sometimes are um, 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 abuse such people, um, and um, and so forth. So it's a question that really deserves a lot more explanation than I just gave it. But I think you get the gist of it. If you have any thoughts on what's being done to sort of deal with this set of problems, um, it would be really helpful for us. And so with that, I have abused my time, and. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Muchas gracias, señor Buchwald. Y le ofrezco la palabra a la señora Ana Raku. Thank you, Chair. Distinguished member of the delegation, welcome to the second round of our dialogue. I would like to thank you for your replies and 
for the figures provided to the committee. I listened carefully to your answers and comments and views, but there are some uh, additional questions that uh, I want to raise uh, dur during this uh, dialogue. Um, the first one refers to children in conflict with the law. Thank you for the details on the provision uh, of the national legislation concerning uh, children in conflict with the law, including um, uh, provision on interrogation procedure, educational programs uh, offered to minors, and of course, um, uh, the update uh, on the solitary confinement um, for juveniles. Um, but yesterday, questions on uh, uh, juveniles in detention uh, referred also to the following issues. Complaints mechanism available for children behind the bars, uh, as well as uh, monitoring visits uh, carried out to the juvenile detention center by relevant bodies and um, specific findings or recommendations made by uh, such uh, bodies. Uh, we will appreciate your replies either now during the dialogue or later uh, in uh, writing. Uh, excessive use of force uh, in places of detention and death in custody. <clears throat> uh, regarding death in custody, we appreciate the details uh, regarding the number of suicides. If I understood correctly, no criminal investigation has been initiated in, uh, on any of these uh, cases. Uh, and we would like to uh, to hear more information uh, about uh, uh, about these um, cases. Um, when the committee requests uh, information on the death in custody, it refers to all death in custody, including those related to natural causes uh, recording during the reporting period. We are still interested uh, to receive statistical data on the number of all death in custody and uh, measures taken by the state party to prevent um, death in custody, including suicides and violent uh, incidents among uh, uh, detainees. Also yesterday, I asked several questions about the use of uh, physical force, firearms, uh, and special means. Uh, including cases of excessive or disproportionate uh, use of force uh, and special means uh, in correctional facilities. So um, mm, I would appreciate your comments and data uh, on the following questions. Um, we want to receive a statistic on uh, the use of physical force uh, and special means by prison staff towards prisoners. Um, Please also provide us with the number of um, uh, uh, <clears throat> cases um, related to uh, guards that have been disciplined for uh, excessive use of force. Uh, and uh, also please provide information, any uh, relevant uh, internal uh, guidelines or um, provision um, that regulate the um, use of force and special means uh, within a uh, um, prison setting. Uh, on women in detention, we uh, appreciate your comments uh, and uh, additional information. What we haven't heard uh, are the information uh, uh, about uh, newly built prison, uh, especially uh, regarding the access to medical care and hygiene products for women and employment and educational programs avail available in, in, the new, uh, uh, in the new prison. I would like also to, to, to hear some information uh, regarding detention regime and conditions for um, convicted mothers with children. Now on uh, other important um, topics such as health in prisons. On this specific subject, uh, I would have uh, a few additional questions which would uh, help us to uh, better understand and assess the situation uh, regarding the access to um, medical care in um, correctional facilities. Um, what are the exact 
procedures or protocols in place uh, once a medical professional finds and document, uh, documents uh, injuries resulting from violence, ill treatment or torture or um, other incidents. Um, also, uh, please provide us an update on the measures taken to provide uh, uh, medical equipment and medicines to pretrial detention institutions and prison, which apparently seems to be uh, problematic, at least in some of the institutions. Um, we are uh, grateful for the information concerning uh, measures taken in order to prevent and control and, and treat the infectious diseases, including tuberculosis. Uh, you have seemingly uh, a very impressive structure set up for uh, tackling uh, TB. Um, can you please describe a little bit more how this would work for, um, in practice for a detainee? Do they need any documentation or a court order to be transferred from a prison uh, detention center to, uh, um, um, a to a special uh, hospital or a prison hospital. Uh, also, uh, I'm interested to know uh, what are the procedures in place for those who refuse such treatment. Uh, uh, I'm referring to TB and HIV uh, treatment. Concerning uh, condition of detention, uh, I would like to thank you for the details uh, regarding uh, construction new prisons, uh, also the update on the correctional staff and uh, current refurbishments uh, um, in, in uh, the penitentiary system of Azerbaijan. Um, I want to reiterate some questions on the situation in pretrial detention units. So we want to hear what exact measures have been taken by the government in order to improve the detention condition in pretrial institutions, which allegedly have the most difficult conditions and are, uh, according to uh, some, uh, some of the reports, are the most overcrowded. <clears throat> uh, what steps have been taken in order to improve the situation of, of uh, um, uh, vulnerable categories of prisoners such as uh, lifers, I mean uh, prisoners convicted to life imprisonment, prisoners with uh, physical and mental disabilities and um, uh, though an elderly um, on a solitary confinement. Um, yesterday uh, I uh, asked some questions concerning uh, appeal procedure for placement in solitary confinement uh, duration and categories of uh, prisoners on whom solitary confinement is most often applied. Um, and today we, we received just the, the um, uh, a positive, a very positive update uh, uh, only for the minors. So we invite you to elaborate a little bit more on the disciplinary sanctions applied to prisoners, including solitary confinement. On psychiatric establishments, um, we would like to thank you for the information provided, um, uh, but I would like to clarify some uh, uh, statements. Is it correct to understand that mechanical restraints are illegal uh, uh, in the state party? If so, could you please point me uh, to the regulation or uh, um, uh, legislation where this is uh, uh, laid out? If not, could you please uh, um, specify uh, the similar um, regulation or legislation for chemical restraints. Um, yesterday I asked specifically um, um, about legal provision practices as well as mechanism to appeal involuntary um, situation or cases of involuntary placement in psychiatric institution and how often um, does a, a review of placement take place and uh, how this process is conducted, uh, and you want, uh, your comments would be uh, appreciated. On uh, my, my last uh, question, uh, refer to investigation of ill treatment and torture cases. Uh, we would like to uh, thank you for uh, the information provided about investigations and prosecutions. 
Uh, we still have some additional questions. Uh, what are the exact number of complaints of torture and treatment received in total, both by uh, ombudsperson and prosecutor office? How many investigation, prosecution, convictions in total? Um, and what provision of the criminal code are perpetrated, convicted under? In addition, we want to clarify if um, uh, an investigation into torture was let's say, domestic or gender-based violence be conducted uh, ex officio in the absence uh, of a complaint of a victim. If you have such figures, uh, please provide it uh, to us. Also, um, we want to receive more information on how the state party is implementing uh, its obligation under Article 14 of the Convention. Could you please uh, uh, provide more information regarding the number of victims uh, of ill treatment or torture who have received compensation during the reporting periods and the amount uh, received. Um, also, we want to hear if um, victims have access to uh, uh, means of redress and rehabilitation or public apologies or other remedies available in, in, in the country. Um, and in advance, I would like to thank you for the um, uh, information pro and data provided to um, uh, our questions and comments. Muchas gracias, señora Raku. Y pregunto si algún otro miembro del comité desea tomar la palabra. Señor Iskan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister, and the delegation for having actively engaged in a dialogue with the committee. As Mr. Buchwald said, we have had abundant information to process, which we will do in due time. I have one additional point to raise. If that is already answered, I regret to have missed it owing to my concurrent engagements. But anyhow, I will raise it. I have noted the amendments made in 2022 to the Code on Execution of Judgments. If my understanding is correct, the amendments aim at allowing the prisoners to have video meetings in addition to phone calls. This constitutes a positive step if the required infrastructure could be made uh, available uh, and if it is applied effectively and without discrimination. Has this amendment been in effect? If so, could you elaborate on the outcome in practice? Thank you, sir. Gracias. ¿Algún otro miembro desea intervenir? De no ser el caso, le doy nuevamente la palabra al señor viceministro. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I thank um, the members of, of the committee uh, for uh, the second round of um, uh, questions uh, that raised um, um, was regarding to the uh, uh, statements and uh, contributions made uh, by uh, our delegations um, following the yesterday's uh, discussions. Um, we were witnessing from one side that um, some of the questions that was raised today um, uh, it was a repetition of the uh, of the uh, of the questions that was addressed in some way by our delegations. I uh, wanted to refer to the issue of um, the new renovated uh, prisoners uh, facilities. Uh, actually. I referred uh, in my um, um, initial statements and um, gave uh, plenty of information about the um, facilities and conditions and the, uh, and the work done um, in these facilities. Um, and today, um, the, the representative of the Minister of Justice already addressed uh, this issue. Uh, we also witnessed uh, that uh, some of the statistical uh, data that was requested uh, was addressed in the uh, inter in a introduction statements uh, by the Ministry of Interior and other delegations. But nonetheless, uh, we will try to go through these uh, uh, questions. Um, I would like to uh, 
Uh, first, start with the, uh, the questions raised by uh, Mr. Todd um, Backwald. Uh, you um, referred to the, um, uh, to the uh, word crude uh, treatment. Uh, uh, maybe it was uh, uh, heard in, uh, or uh, stated a little bit incorrectly, but um, uh, I can assure you uh, it was in a context of ill treatment, not uh, any other meaning uh, in the uh, cruel uh, treatment. Uh, with regard to the publication of the uh, reports, um, uh, actually uh, that, that is not a matter for the government to avoid any criticism. Uh, uh, if you will look at the practice um, um, we, we, we had before, um, uh, the government always was in a, in a position to openly work with the, with the committee and uh, um, many reports was published uh, previously, but it's a matter of, uh, of choice that uh, this is a government is a position whether to publish or not. And uh, uh, we took note uh, your uh, request uh, for the government uh, to publish it. Uh, we will uh, uh, in due, duly uh, consider uh, this um, uh, interest of the committee for publishing the reports. On the matter of registration of MP, uh, NGOs, uh, yesterday when uh, that question was raised, I, I already told that uh, some of the questions um, was not fall to the uh, competences of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the committee. Uh, and I said that the, the matter of the new law on media and the registration of the NGOs, uh, this is not a matter of the um, uh, committee's uh, mandate, and we provided all this information under the other um, uh, uh, treaty bodies' uh, me mechanisms. Uh, and if you uh, want, of course, uh, to uh, the, the, the the information to be uh, discussed within this uh, committee as well, of course, we will provide it in writing to you all the information that we already shared with the, under the other mechanisms. <coughs> Uh, concerning the um, International uh, Court of Justice, uh, I, I, you, you are maybe no better than others uh, that uh, the international uh, crimes. Uh, uh, oh, no, uh, yesterday, uh, the, uh, the the question was uh, uh, raised about the. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan's uh, interest in the work with the uh, International uh, Criminal Court and uh, the uh, the issue that uh, whether we are ready to cooperate uh, with the uh, with the uh, International Criminal Court on the matters and you all know that um, uh, the uh, the <clears throat> international crimes that uh, fall under the uh, jurisdiction of the court uh, all these crimes was committed against uh, the, 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 my country during the uh, 30 years of aggression and occupation. And uh, Azerbaijan is one of the country who advocated for the uh, long period of time of uh, avoiding the impunity for the criminals uh, who are committing uh, these uh, international crimes. But uh, at the same time, um, uh, the, uh, Azerbaijan is still considering um, the, and, um, and uh, closely uh, uh, monitoring the work of the ICA International Co Criminal Court. And uh, uh, for time being, uh, 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 I think that uh, it will be um, uh, difficult for me to, uh, to announce any uh, issues, uh, but um, when the de uh, any decision will be adopted on in due course, uh, the committee will be informed about that. Uh, I think that uh, on LGBT, uh, I just wanted to draw your attention that um, all um, citizens uh, in the country are equal before the law. And uh, Azerbaijan guarantees uh, the, uh, the rights of all the uh, citizens without any uh, distinction as to the uh, sexual orientation or, or any others. And we don't have uh, the division of our society on, on these categories. Uh, so uh, the, this uh, the category of uh, persons are the citizens of Azerbaijan and they fall under the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, of the Constitution and other uh, legislation uh, in, uh, in equal to uh, with uh, other uh, citizens of the Republic of Azerbaijan. 
On um, other issues, I think that I can uh, uh, maybe uh, give the to, to give uh, the floor to uh, the deputy um, uh, head of the Supreme Court, uh, Mr. Chinggis Tafsirin, for for, uh, for giving uh, some additional clarification, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharifov. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, coming back to the question which I addressed yesterday, I don't want to go into uh, the legal debates here, but when we speak prisoners of war, these are person, individuals who were captured during the uh, military facilities. These 23 individuals which you refer to, Mr. Bakbol, they were uh, individuals of Armenian origin, nationals of the Republic of Armenia, captured some 150 kilometers from the Armenian uh, Azerbaijani border inside the t sovereign territory of Azerbaijan. And uh, one month after the uh, ceasefire trilateral agreement, uh, and uh, they cannot be regarded prisoners of war, uh, no, no way. Uh, accordingly, they were uh, treated as uh, civilian prisoners, and even in the before the European Court of Human Rights, in uh, these cases are there, proceedings are being uh, in, uh, undergone in the before the European Court of Human Rights. They are not be referred to as prisoners of war, but just uh, ordinary civilian prisoners. Uh, all of them, of all of the foreigners. Uh, they are being uh, insured with the uh, legal assistance and with the interpreter. Recently, I would uh, just, for example, tell you that uh, recently within the communication with the European Court of Human Rights concerning the cases of uh, uh, individuals of Armenian origin and Armenian nationality, we sent uh, a bundle of some five uh, 50,000 pages of uh, materials of criminal proceedings in Armenian languages, language. That means that all of them are being provided with the legal assistance and with the interpreter. And uh, they are being insured with the right to access to justice. We didn't receive in the internal proceedings any complaints of uh, Armenians to uh, your treatment or torture, and that's uh, therefore I cannot give you any example of examination of their uh, complaints on this point. Uh, concerning the question of them being charged with the crime of terrorism, it's again it's only charge. It's not the case. This no, is, it is is not brought to the court. They are not being tried. According to the legislation of Azerbaijan, the court is not binded by the Indictment Act and can interpret the crime committed on its own. And therefore, uh, even if we now uh, see that they are being indicted or charged with that act of terrorism, it is up to the court, the national court, to uh, sentence them or to acquit them on that uh, crime. And uh, concerning the LGBT, uh, if I may add, uh, we uh, there is no limitation on, uh, as Mr. Sharif told, limitation in the legislation on uh, the uh, sexual orientation. And uh, recently, before the European Court of Human Rights, there were a decision on, uh, concerning the case of some 20 five uh, representatives of LGBTI community in Azerbaijan. The case referred to the uh, events happened some six years ag ago concerning uh, these uh, individuals, the administrative arrest, and the government of Azerbaijan uh, submitted to the court the unilateral declaration acknowledging their violation of the rights of these individuals, and therefore the court ac uh, accepted this unilateral declaration and declared the uh, the case inadmissible. 
but uh, uh, I bring this example to, t to say that this was the only one case that was uh, some six years ago, and uh, after that, the uh, law enforcement agency they uh, they were not faced with some with such uh, events or uh, detention of representatives of in the LGBTI community because of their sexual orientation. Thank you. <coughs> I, th I thank you, Mr. Askarev, and I just wanted to give the floor to Mr. Adil uh, Abilov uh, uh, from the Minister of Justice. Please, you have the floor. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Sheriff. Uh, just uh, a quick reaction. Well, to be honest, uh, it was a time constraint, so I was going to address a couple of issues later on, but yet uh, just going through the questions uh, regarding the monitoring of the facility for juveniles. It's not only this facility, but uh, it's all the facilities under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Justice that we have specifically, as Mr. Sharifov also mentioned uh, in his opening statement, since 2006, uh, a <clears throat> Uh, public committee, it used to be called public committee, now it's public council, which is formed of the prominent NGO activists that have a specific group which can uh, visit any time uh, any uh, penitentiary facility without uh, prior uh, notification to the Minister of Justice. They get a specific mandate as CPT members uh, from the Minister of Justice so that just showing this mandate they can enter any facility, they come up with a specific reports, uh, which they later on send to the Minister of Justice, not to the penitentiary service, but to the Minister of Justice, to the Minister, to be reported to Minister directly, so that uh, then actions uh, and following instructions would be sent to the uh, uh, penitentiary service. Regarding the uh, specific question that whether we have a uh, uh, kind of guidelines on the excessive use of force. Uh, indeed, yes, we do. We do have these guidelines and uh, in uh, uh, 2022, following up the CPT visit, we even uh, amended these guidelines uh, following the recommendations and but basically these guidelines are, are based on the uh, CPT standards. But yet, it's still being improved following the uh, uh, recommendations of the CPT. Uh, then, uh, when it comes to the uh, women in detention, uh, basically, as uh, also has been mentioned yesterday and today, we have there is only one uh, separate penitentiary facility for females, which has been newly built. So. Uh, of course, it's a mixed regime. Uh, the only thing that, according to our legislation, women cannot be uh, sentenced to uh, life imprisonment. So basically, it's a mixed regime. There are different blocks, and uh, they they are detained according to the regime provided by the court sentence. When it comes to the mothers with children, just yesterday I checked with the penitentiary service. There are only three mothers at the moment who have uh, kids under three years old who are, of course, with their mothers. Uh, however, when it comes to these mothers, they have a separate uh, conditions, uh, separate cells, uh, that, and with the playing ground and playing rooms, specifically for these kids. And uh, also they have extra uh, rights to get extra visits. When it comes to the protocols registering traces of torture, I, I mean, of course, the Istanbul protocol that I also mentioned, we have uh, our officers trained mandatory in this particular area. Uh, the procedure is that whenever a person enters the facility under the jurisdiction of the pretrial detention facility, the medical member of the medical staff, so not a penitentiary officer, member of the medical staff, they are not subordinate to a penitentiary system. The whole department is subordinate directly to minister himself. So they do... They, 
they do the uh, recording. They do the recording, uh, and then if there are traces, this is suspicion uh, regarding the uh, traces, like followed up by, by by torture. Then they send it to a prosecution service. Uh, so that's that's the protocol that they follow. Uh, when it comes to medical care in pretrial, specifically also coming to uh, women. Uh, again, um, the uh, following the uh, recommendations, uh, following the recommendations by the CPT, uh, we have a specific uh, decision by the Cabinet of Ministers uh, that provides a, uh, elementary needs like hygienic packs and especially with for females with kids like pumpers and so on. Uh, the uh, m amount of money allocated uh, uh, in this in this decision was increased uh, substantively. Uh, it was it was done. Uh, let me just check with the, with them. Can get the. I I think it was done in 2022 or 2023. I might be mistaken. Uh, and uh, when it when it comes to just next question. Uh, when it comes to the transfer uh, to to if the person is sick or diagnosed with with TB or HIV, then uh, it's uh, just our medical department submits the list to the penitentiary service, and uh, penitentiary service uh, does the transfer. Uh, when it's an urgent case, it's, it is done without submission and it's just uh, discussed orally. Uh, however, I'm afraid we haven't had the cases of uh, when the person diagnosed with these diseases rejected the medical treatment, so uh, I can't provide you information with that. When it comes to, uh, when you mentioned the overcrowding, uh, the pre-trial detention facilities, actually uh, these two new facilities that I mentioned in Umbaki and Lankaran, they do have separate blocks, uh, each 700 cap with the 700 capacity uh, for pre-trial detainees. So that was the idea to reduce the overcrowding in pre-trial detention, so we have two new pre-trial detentions. One, it's very close to Baku. The other one is in, in the region. When it comes to lifers, the, the, the same goes for lifers as well. As well, as I said, Gobustan prison, uh, uh, where the, the, only sp the only actual prison re with a prison regime, facility with a prison regime in Azerbaijan, it was uh, closed and uh, lifers were moved to a new prison in Umbake. So where the where which CPT uh, members visited uh, while this facility was under construction. When it comes to the appeal procedure on putting into solitary confinement, uh, the person, uh, the subject of this procedure, he can appeal to uh, a prison uh, director, to penitentiary service, and to the court as well. So he's free to 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 do one of these three options. So I think I uh, mostly covered the questions by Madame Raku. And when it comes to, uh, question, uh, to the question of our colleague from Turkey, yes, indeed, uh, the, the, the good thing about COVID, if I might say, is that it really did push the uh, development of IT technology in, in, uh, in, in all places, including, and prisons are no exception. So we, with us, uh, we have, uh, si first we started with the establishing video conferencing equipment uh, to make sure courts can proceed uh, without delay. Then the, this is the same uh, actually equipment which is being used for video meetings. So the, at the moment it's widely used, especially uh, when the person, when the relatives are supposed to travel like 100, 200 kilometers to see his relatives, so they sometimes prefer to have this video meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I thank you, Mr. Abilov, um, for
for uh, giving additional uh, clarifications. Um, now I wanted to um, to return the uh, floor to Mr. Fazil Guliev. Um, Uh, then I think that I will uh, return back the, 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 the floor to uh, Chinggis Askarev, um, the deputy head of the um, uh, Supreme Court. Please. I've been asked to explain what does it mean, the root treatment, uh, Mr. Bakvor. So it's, uh, as far as I understand, it is uh, the treatment which even uh, do not, uh, does not attend the le attain the level of ill treatment. It means uh, uh, in ethical behavior of police officer towards uh, the indi an individual. That means, for example, shouting improper remarks or uh, even refusal to uh, assist an individual. It is uh, factually, in fact, it, it, it means that uh, we, we can call it like a, a breach of code of ethics. Thank you. Uh, I thank you, uh, Mr. Askarev. I think that uh, I wanted to uh, give the floor now uh, to Mr. Elgar Gasimov uh, for uh, giving some uh, replies to the questions related uh, to uh, your competences uh, raised by the Madame Raku on the chemical medicines and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by mechanical, sorry, by mechanical restraints, uh, I was referring to to the um, um, use of vets and uh, belts uh, during uh, um, specific uh, situation when the the patients are uh, have a specific behavior, including aggressive one. Благодарю. Я откровенно вчера не понял вопроса. Думал, речь идет о усмирительных рубашках. Провел информацию, анализ. Мне сказали, лет 50-60 мы не используем в Азербайджане усмирительные рубашки. То, что касается фиксации к столу или в транспортировке пациента в состоянии агрессивном состоянии в скорой помощи, безусловно, там может использоваться кратковременная фиксация мягкими ремнями. Однако в стационаре проводится беседа, если пациент слышит и входит в контакт. Далее разъясняется, в случае отказа и агрессивного поведения фиксация при помощи медперсонала, чтобы провести инъекцию. И кратковременная фиксация в течение до часа. Это вносится в журнал обязательно. В некоторых случаях это используется. Потому что если пациент до инъекции. Благодарю. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, we, we, we had uh, some um, <clears throat> speakers uh, from the first round of um, speeches. And uh, if the time allows, uh, because uh, they also wanted to address some questions which, uh, that was raised uh, yesterday. And uh, with your permission, if you will allow yeah. me, I will give the floor to that, uh, those delegations. Uh, 
then I would like to um, to give the floor to uh, Mr. Uh, Wahid Kahramanov, uh, head of the uh, Department for Migration Policy and Legal Support uh, of the State of Migration Services, to address uh, the issues of uh, refugees, uh, expulsions, and uh, deportations, as it was uh, raised yesterday. You have the floor, please. Спасибо, господин Шарифов. Ходатайство или желающие получить статус беженца в Азербайджанской республике рассматривается в рамках требований Конвенции 51 года о статусе беженцев и протоколом 67 -го года, а также законом Азербайджанской республики о статусе беженцев и вынужденных переселенцев лиц, перемещенных в пределах страны и порядком рассмотрения ходатайства о предоставлении статуса беженца, утвержденным соответствующим указом, нормы которых соответствуют перечисленным международным документам. Ни в конвенции, ни в протоколе к ней не предусмотрена дополнительная форма международной защиты, Ни в конвенции, ни в протоколе к ней не предусмотрена дополнительная форма международной защиты для лиц, ищущих убежище, кроме как признание лица беженца. Поэтому в нашем э, национальном законодательстве нет других видов защиты в отношении лиц, ищущих убежище. Принимая во внимание создание в Азербайджанской республике эффективной системы убежища и права всех иностранцев и лиц без гражданства, ходатайствует о предоставлении статуса беженца, обеспечивается без какой-либо дискриминации. Поэтому с 1 июля 2020 года процедура определения статуса беженца управлением Верховного комиссара ООН по делам беженцев в Азербайджане полностью переостановлено. С этой даты ходатайство лиц, ищущих убежище, рассматривается только государственной миграционной службой и национальными судами Азербайджанской республики. Те лица, которые являются мандатными беженцами или получили дополнительные формы международной защиты со стороны УВКБ ООН по делам беженцев, в Азербайджане до 1 июля 2020 года ни при каких обстоятельствах не были не были направлены или принудительно возвращены в страну, где их жизнь и свободе, свобода окажется под угрозой. Требования статьи 15 закона Азербайджанской республики о статусе беженцев и вынужденных переселенцев соответствует требованиям статей 32 и 33 Конвенции 51 года. То есть э, статьи называется высылка и, и запрещение высылки беженцев и, 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 или их принудительного возвращения в страну, их, которых, из которой они прибыли. Лица, которым было отказано в предоставлении статуса беженца, с правом обжалования решения и с учетом вытекающих из него вопросов, в конечном итоге, в зависимости от решения суда, добровольно покидают территорию Азербайджанской республики в различных направлениях, если они не имеют основания проживать в стране на законных основаниях. В период с 1 января 2020 по 1 февраля 2024 года не принималось решение о возвращении, депортации, или экстрадиции лиц, обратившихся за получением статуса беженца, а также лиц, которым статус беженца был предоставлен. Сейчас коротко хотел бы дать информацию, которая была вчера запрошена о Мехмета Гелена, гражданина Турецкой Республики, 85-го года рождения. Он вместе с, с членами своей семьи 25 июля 2017 года, 2017 года обратился в Государственную миграционную службу Азербайджанской республики за получением статуса беженца. 
его ходатайство было зарегистрировано Государственной миграционной службой. В ходе собеседования он заявил, что не является членом какой-либо группировки в Турции и что он не располагает никакой информации об интересе к нему со стороны властей. На основании фактов, изложенных заявителем в ходе рассмотрения заявления, вероятность того, что он подвергнется преследованиям при возвращении в Турцию, не рассматривалась как вполне обоснованное опасение преследования. Возможность Подвергание каким-либо преследованиям оценивалось, оценивалось, ссылаясь на международные базы, собирающие информацию о стране происхождения. По результатам, по результатам расследования его дела, его дела было принято решение от 25 октября 2017 года об отказе в представлении ему статуса беженца. Мехмед Гелен и его жене Мерьем Гелен обратились в Бакинский административно-экономический суд номер один в связи с оспариванием решения и предъявили требования возложить в обязанность принятия решения о представлении статуса беженца в Государственную миграционную службу. Решением суда от 3 апреля 2018 года иск не был удовлетворен. Они э, подали в Бакинский апелляционный суд апелляционную жалобу на вышеупомянутое решение суда. Апелляционная жалоба, поданная из сами по решению суда от 22 июня 2018 года, была отклонена. Мехмед Герин и его жена подали кассионную жалобу Верховного суда Азербайджанской Республики на вышеупомянутое решение Бакинского апелляционного суда. Кассационная жалоба не была удовлетворена решением Верховного суда Азербайджанской Республики от 15 октября 2018 года. И решение осталось в силе без изменений. Спасибо за внимание. I will give uh, the floor to the uh, <coughs> Zaur uh, Ibrahimov, Deputy Chair of Social Service Agency under the Minister of Labor and Social Protection of Population to address the issue um, uh, <coughs> on assistance uh, to the victims of human trafficking, uh, adaptation uh, and rehabilitation measures uh, of the prisoners. You have a floor. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Your Excellency Committee Chairman, distinguished uh, committee members, I would like to uh, inform you about uh, social uh, works have been uh, carried out with this uh, sensible people, the, the group of people that uh, uh, our colleagues and the reporters uh, talked about. It's one of them is like uh, this ser social service carried out about our uh, institution, which is uh, uh, the center of assistance of victims of human trafficking, subordinate in the social service agency under the Minister of Labor and Social Protection of Population carries out following activities. So the first uh, activity is that uh, it implements rehabilitation measures to help victims of human trafficking reintegrate into society and return to a normal life. Next, center carries out social work with victims of human trafficking and potential victims of human trafficking, provides them with a social service. It provides legal, psychological assistance to the victims of human uh, trafficking in order to restore their rights and to eliminate the physical trauma inflicted on them and their family members. Medical rehabilitation of victims of human trafficking also is a very important issue. So center implements therapeutic measures aimed to restoring impaired or lost functions, eliminates the consequences of their illnesses, injuries, complete or partial restoration of their physical and anatomical disorders. Center also assists in provision of professional training retraining and employment of victims of human trafficking and continuing their education. Lastly, I would like to also mention that the center is acting as a temporary shelter for victims of human trafficking and also suspected victims of human trafficking. Namely, for the year of 2020, the center has provided assistance to 291 victims. The victims assisted by the center are potential victims referred by the main directorate 
for combating human trafficking of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, as well as on the basis of personal appeals and referred by various non-governmental organizations. So the, uh, the second institution that uh, I want to uh, give you informa information about, uh, I will try to do it quickly. So the, it is the <clears throat> Department for the uh, Social Rehabilitation of Victims of Domestic Violence that was also uh, point out by the uh, reporters about the information about uh, this uh, sensitive group. So the, uh, this uh, department started operating on August, the 1st of August of 2021. It was established with the aim to provide the victims of domestic violence with assistance services that meet modern standards, prevent domestic violence, and take preventive measures in the area of uh, achieve a long-term solution to the problem of domestic violence and its consequences. Since August, 1st of August 2021, 164 victims of violence have received social services. In total, social ser services have been provided to 1,052 people from vulnerable groups. I want to proceed my speech with the, uh, the call center, which is 116123, which is called in Nazari uh, Gairi. It is a call center of the social service agency. It started operating from the 1st of February 2022. The call center's purpose is to provide information, answer questions related to the activities of social services agency directly after processing the appeal and offer advisory service to individuals and families in difficult life situations. In addition, it provides socio-psychological consultation, receive applications such as requests, complaints, proposals, and toward them to the relevant structural units. It should be also mentioned that the center uh, act, uh, activities included support line for the victims of the domestic violence. Between 2022 and uh, June 2023, the center received 3,075 calls. As of June 2023, the center has been integrated into 142 call center, which is the uh, call center of the Minister of Labor and Social Protection of Population of Azerbaijan. Following the integration process, the 116 and 123 call center provides only uh, uninterrupted 724 service only to victims of domestic violence. Incoming calls are promptly uh, forwarded to the social services agency, regional offices, and evaluated, and persons identified as victims of domestic violence are immediately placed into appropriate institutions. I just uh, go quickly to the uh, third uh, subject that uh, Madame Gahraman also, Gahraman also mentioned in her speech about the trainings about the domestic violence. Also, uh, our uh, ministry, uh, the, our uh, social uh, service uh, agents, which is under the uh, our ministry, so it's, it started uh, since 2013. The Minister of Labor and Social Protection of Population has been providing protection for persons in difficult living conditions by awarding government orders in the field of social services to non-governmental and non-profit organizations, including social orders to prevent domestic violence. All this implemented in accordance with the law of the Azerbaijan Republic on social services. There are two projects that I want to form related to domestic violence implemented in 2021. First project is increasing the knowledge and skills of civil society organizations in the fight against domestic violence has been implemented. The project aimed to increase awareness and knowledge of means of protection against domestic violence among the population as well as to promote education in the field of combating domestic violence. And the next one is promoting trust in means of protection against domestic violence, prom promotion of adopt adoption and attention in societal persons from vulnerable groups aimed to promote awareness and educational measures in the field of 
preventing and combating domestic violence. The last one, if I have a time, uh, I just want to quickly point out also Mr. Uh, Adilov's, uh, uh, in his speech, he talked about the, the work done with the, uh, with the persons who are, have been released from the serving sentences in the penalty institutions. So in 2023, uh, on the social work carried out by the Social Service Agency under the Minister of Labor and Social Protection of Republic of Azerbaijan, in order to assess the need of the social psychological service of persons who have been released from the serving sentences in, penal, in penitentiary institutions, have been sentenced to parole, have been con, uh, conditionally released from the punishment before the time limit or have been suspended by the court. So the first one is uh, conducting social work with the persons on uh, probation uh, in order to prevent recidivism of convicts who have been released from the serving sentences and released on the parole to the social uh, environmental, social rehabilitation. Oriented activities are carried out with the guide of Article 7 of the law of the Azerbaijan Republic on social adaptation of persons released from the serving sent uh, sentences in penitentiary institutions. Article 7 and 20, uh, 23 of the law on social services and Article uh, 23 and the subsec uh, subsection of the 3.1 uh, point 10 of the Charter of the Social Services Agency. I'd like to draw your attention that social adaptation and rehabilitation of prisoners is being implemented together with the probation department of the Minister of Justice. And during the year, an initial assessment was uh, conducted with 64 people. 44 of them were evaluated in detail. An individual development plan was drawn up to 41 people and the service was finalized with the other 23 people. In addition to this, let me elaborate further uh, about conducting social work with the prisoners released from the serving sentence in penitentiary institutions. An initial assessment was conducted in the form of the questionnaire survey with 25 convicts in the penitentiary institution three months before the release after the comprehension of their sentences. Activities aimed at support their social psychological adaptation to society are performed. In conclusion, I want to add uh, about uh, so, uh, social adaptation of the person released on the amnesty. An amnesty was uh, conducted with three people, women, who were released from the penitentiary by the president of our country, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, and the individual development plan was drawn about them and uh, the work is continuing at the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, I thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Ibrahimov, for your uh, information. I think that uh, our Deputy uh, Minister of um, Health uh, wanted to add some uh, points. Uh, da, uh, uh, благодарю. Я хотел бы к дополнению к механической фиксации дополнить, что в Азербайджане во всех психиатрических центрах э, работают по клиническим, британским клиническим протоколам, переведенным на азербайджанский язык. Однако акцентирование на этом вопросе заставляет, я думаю, сделать нам мониторинг. Я думаю, мы будем делать мониторинг э, центров рандомный, э, и проанализируем эту ситуацию. Спасибо вам. Mr. Chair, um, yesterday we, uh, we interrupted our discussions on the statement by the Minister of, uh, from the representative from the Minister of Defense. If we have a time, we, with your permission, we, we can give him we the have, uh, five minutes. For five minutes. Okay. Then, with your permission, Mr. Chair, uh, <coughs> I wanted to give uh, the floor. Uh, Спасибо за пять минут. Я постараюсь. Я хочу дать ответ господину Бухвольду по поводу возмещения ущерба. Вчера был ответ на этот вопрос. У нас 
э, есть закон о возмещении ущерба. Соответственно, с этим законом э, суд должен вынести решение о возмещении ущерба, в том числе морального. Э, хочу, э, возможно, у вас нет полностью данных, значит, 18 человек по татарскому делу вынес на оправдательный приговор э, Верховным судом. В данный момент э, три из них получили решением суда, э, в их, э, есть решение суда о возмещении ущерба. По времени сейчас они подают иск, должно рассматриваться и будет решаться вопрос э, суммы, потому что они моральный ущерб, а, разные суммы э, озвучивают, поэтому будет решаться. То есть эта работа идет. И то, что вы вчера сказали, что 405 человек э, потерпевших по тартарскому делу. Дело в том, что Следствие признало их потерпевшим, но признало потому, что их незаконно лишили свободы, но не ко всем из них были применены так называемые пытки. И к тому же в начале этого года судом были осуждены 7 человек, кроме 17 человек, в том числе высокопоставленный генерал азербайджанской армии который э, по другому направлению, в другой войсковой части, то тоже аналогичную, похожую деятельность совершал. То есть э, Азербайджан демократическая страна, она борется с пытками, э, и каждый, кто участвовал в этом, получит свое, э, свое наказание, в том числе высокопоставленные лица, как видите, э, генерал осужден за это. Теперь, если вы разрешите, я хочу показать, в чем вчера остановился, на чем. После войны 2020 -го года мы провели мониторинг и посмотрели, что можно сделать еще по гуманитарному праву. И когда готовилась антитеррористическая операция, до этого мы приготовили буклеты, которые были, так сказать, разбросаны по Карабаху, где местному населению мы э, объясняли, в чем обращение. Мы э, обращались к вооруженным людям, которые там, э, не гражданам Азербайджана, э, вот буклеты, которые, чтобы они складывали оружие и так далее, что они э, э, не были, э, так сказать, к ним были применены какие-то меры. Вот эти буклеты. Также э, министр обороны э, издал приказ номер 122 29 апреля 2022 года о проведении необходимых мероприятий по соблюдению норм международного гуманитарного права должностным лицам азербайджанской армии. Подпись, которая была доведена под подпись всему личному составу азербайджанской армии. И после там есть пункты, допустим, высказывания ненавистных выражений в отношении лиц армянской национальности и пропаганда дискриминации, в местах дислокации частей подразделения азербайджанской армии, вход в церкви, другие места поклонения, кладбище, совершение вандалистских актов и оскорбительных действий в отношении всех видов памятников, артефактов, а также объектов, имеющих культурную ценность, являющихся историческим культурным наследием, действия направленные на повреждение, уничтожение, деформацию и потери ценности экземпляров культурного наследия зодчества. Согласно приказу, перед должностными лицами азербайджанской армии были поставлены задачи о привлечении в установленном законом, э, в установленном, о привлечении в установленном законом порядке к ответственности лиц, совершившего указанные деяния, а также в целях организации более широкого преподавания международного права. Хочу заметить, что э, после контртеррористической операции в 2023 году э, четверо лиц азербайджанской армии, совершившие нарушение прав Уголовного кодекса статьи 116. Это нарушение норм международного права во время вооруженного конфликта. В отношении них было возбуждено уголовное дело по этой статье и направлено в следственные органы. То есть э, азербайджанская армия чтит э, нормы международного права. Мы постоянно работаем над этим. И спасибо за то, что вы Дали мне возможность закончить. Muchas gracias, señor de viceministro. Eh, quiero en nombre del comité agradecerle a usted y a todos los miembros de la delegación sus respuestas. 
y sus eh, comentarios a los distintos y variados temas que fueron planteados durante estos dos eh, días. Eh, como le llegué a mencionar, eh, la delegación tiene un plazo de 48 horas para poder proporcionar cualquier información adicional que ustedes estimen que sea conveniente para las deliberaciones del comité. Se ha hablado de estadísticas, se ha hablado de cuestiones muy eh, puntuales y también que eh, puedan a, abordar tal vez cuestiones que no hubo el tiempo necesario para poderlas este, eh, responder. El 9 de mayo a las 6 de la tarde, la eh, misión aquí en Ginebra va a recibir el documento que nosotros llamamos observaciones finales, es decir, a partir del diálogo que hemos tenido con ustedes, el comité va a elaborar un documento final de observaciones eh, finales que eh, se les remitirá eh, no para que entren en el detalle de la sustancia, pero sí tal vez corregir nombres de instituciones, fechas, lo que sea necesario eh, 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 precisar. Y el 10 de mayo daremos a conocer públicamente las observaciones eh, finales de los seis estados que estamos examinando en este periodo de sesiones. Quisiera eh, tal vez eh, precisar que tendremos que en toda observación, documento de observaciones finales, destacamos tres o cuatro asuntos que consideramos como prioritarios y que pueden ser eh, eh, cumplidos o alcanzados en el plazo de, de un año. ¿no? Sí, lo que nos interesa mucho al comité es mantener un contacto permanente con, la, con, la de, con los estados a través de este diálogo y este proceso. Eh, también ustedes recibirán ya posteriormente eh, una misiva por parte del relator de seguimiento de las recomendaciones bajo el artículo 19 para ver de qué manera ustedes vienen cumpliendo o eh, aplicando las recomendaciones que el comité les está formulando, recomendaciones que a juicios del comité podrían ayudarles a ustedes como Estado parte de la convención a cumplir con todas las disposiciones. No son una imposición, es una recomendación, una llamada a atención de, eh, sobre los cuales el comité desea llamar, este, enfatizar para su, eh, su eh, consideración. Quisiera destacar el espíritu constructivo y positivo que ha tenido este, este intercambio. Creo que hemos hablado de dos temas fundamentales. Eh, uno, la situación en Azerbaiyán, pero también hemos hablado de una guerra y obviamente que sí nos preocupa al comité en un contexto internacional en que proliferan conflictos, eh, guerras, en que obviamente se cometen por las partes graves violaciones de derechos humanos, incluyendo la tortura. Hemos eh, recibido información indirecta de que eh, están eh, en un proceso de buscar un acuerdo con Armenia. Esperamos que en términos de paz esto sea un objetivo alcanzable que obviamente sería muy apreciado no solo por nosotros, sino por la eh, comunidad eh, internacional. Y no me queda más, eh, señor viceministro, que eh, cederle la palabra para, sus, eh, para su intervención eh, final. Tiene usted la palabra. Mr. Chairman, before I, uh, I will uh, make my uh, concluding remarks, 
Um, maybe one question I just uh, I wanted to, to raise. Uh, you, you mentioned that on 9 May uh, you, you are going to present uh, the concluding observations. On 9 May we are have a holiday, and maybe it uh, will be possible to present it uh, or t two days before or two days later of uh, the day of 9 May. Thank you, thank you, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in conclusion, uh, once uh, again, I would like to underline uh, that the government uh, adherence to the protection uh, uh, and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms at the national level, um, and we consider all relevant UN treaty bodies mechanisms, including the Cut Review, as a good opportunity uh, for all of us to, uh, to declare what actions have been taken by the government to further improve the human rights situation uh, in the country and what challenges it faces in fulfilling its uh, obligations. We also proceed uh, from uh, understanding that the review uh, mechanism constitutes an essential tool uh, to share best human rights um, practices in order to uh, enhance capacity uh, to deal effectively with possible human rights challenges. Bearing uh, this in mind, my country is among those ones who constantly and timely present its periodic reports uh, to all human uh, rights treaty bodies uh, and the Human Rights Council, uh, including the interim reports on a voluntary basis. Um, <clears throat> since the last periodic review, uh, my government continued to undertake all necessary measures to enhance the human rights records in the country, including on prevention of torture, and with that purpose adopted uh, several laws, uh, enacted uh, uh, the uh, number of programs, um, uh, national plans, and strategies, strategies to ensure in practice uh, compliance with the state's uh, obligations uh, under the uh, convention. Unfortunately, uh, the time allowed to, for the delegation does not uh, allow to provide the overall information on the reforms uh, in the country and measures taken to implement uh, the recommendations made um, uh, following the last uh, review. Despite the general spirit of um, cooperation that uh, always existed uh, in this uh, audience, uh, any recommendations uh, that does not uh, based on established facts and reports received uh, from the credible uh, sources, uh, questions that do not fall into the uh, committee's uh, mandate uh, do not contribute to the review process. Irrespective of that, um, uh, my delegation consider today's dialogue as very engaging and productive and express its readiness to further uh, cooperation. I would like to thank the esteemed rapporteurs uh, members of the committee, uh, special thanks for the chair, uh, for productive dialogue uh, and our uh, delegation, uh, without the delegation, as well as express appreciation uh, to the interpreters for the great job done. I uh, thank you. Muchas gracias, señor viceministro. Eh, repito que el comité actúa con la mayor independencia, profesionalismo cuando elabora sus recomendaciones y cuando analiza la uh, información que tiene disponible eh, sobre un, un estado parte. Y estoy seguro de que ese es el espíritu que va a predominar este, cuando elaboremos las observaciones eh, finales. Les agradecemos un feliz eh, retorno. Agradecemos su desplazamiento a Ginebra. Y antes de levantar la sesión, les recuerdo a los miembros del comité que mañana nos reuniremos a las once y media. Muchas gracias. Se levanta la sesión. <tose>